district attorney's office to charge the suspect with 10 counts of murder in the first degree and one count of attempted murder in the first degree. The officer who exchanged gunfire with the suspect has been put on administrative leave per our normal standard operating procedures. The officer, an 11 year Boulder Police Department veteran, was not injured during this incident. <clears throat> the firearm used by the suspect in King Supers on March 22nd is a semi-automatic Ruger AR-556 pistol. It was legally purchased in a gun store in Arvada, Colorado. The defendant was also in possession of a 9mm handgun, but at this time we do not believe that gun was used in this incident. On Wednesday, the crime scene personnel finished the King Supers lot parking lot and was able to successfully release many of those vehicles to their rightful owner. Yesterday, a team of investigators, including myself, did a walkthrough of the entire crime scene, which was very complex and obviously very challenging to not only myself, but the investigative team. I just wanna say a few things about the community. We have received such an outpouring of sorrow, grief, uh, and just, it's just been extremely um, heartening for me to see how the community supports this police department and the other victims involved in this unbelievable incident. For that, I just want the community to know that I'm very grateful. <clears throat> I also want to end on this because I have never seen this happen in my 30 year career. We have been able to successfully pull a team of victims advocates from across this region to work not only with our police department, but all of the victims family. And I think that is so important because this is just the beginning of this journey. And this will be at least a year long journey for these uh, victims families and the police involved in this case. So I have never seen such a great tool used in such a wonderful way. And for that, I'm extremely grateful as well. And I think we're going to answer some questions after District Attorney Mark, Michael Doherty speaks. Michael? Thank you, Chief. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Doherty. I am the District Attorney for Boulder County. And on Monday, Boulder suffered devastating, horrific, and traumatic attack to our community. Ten people were killed, and many others were placed in grave danger. Our thoughts and prayers are with the victims, their loved ones, and this community during the difficult time that we're all going through. And we are committed to ensuring that justice is done for each and every one of the victims and for their loved ones. Yesterday, the defendant had his first advisement in court. He was advised of his rights by the judge, and he's currently being held without bond and remains in custody. Next week, the court will announce the next court date, and we'll share that information with the community as soon as the court announces the court schedule. And at some point, we'll have a hearing. It's called a proof evident presumption great hearing, which in Colorado is required by law when someone's being charged with first degree murder and held without bond. The court has allowed some time for that hearing to take place so that the defense attorneys and the prosecutors have time to go through all the video evidence, all the reports, and all the discovery. And again, that next court date will be announced by state judicial next week. I do want to stress, of course, the defendant has the right, the constitutional right to a fair trial. It's important that I stress that every time I talk to the media and community for a few reasons. First and foremost, it's the right thing for me to say and the right thing for us to do to ensure that he has a fair trial and that at the end of the trial, he be held fully responsible for his actions. Second, I want to make sure that we use due caution in talking about the case and the facts of the case in order to protect his right to a fair trial, but also to make sure that that trial takes place here in Boulder County. If we share too much about the facts or the investigation, it's possible we'll see a motion by the defense to move this trial to somewhere else in the state of Colorado. And I want to make sure that the people of Boulder have the opportunity this trial to be held and for justice to be done here in Boulder County. So you'll hear me say every time I meet the press, now the charges have been filed, that the defendant is presumed innocent unless and until 
he's proven guilty. It will be a lengthy court process. In every murder prosecution, the process takes at least a year for us to complete. I anticipate that that will be the same in this case. So I share that with you as I do with the victim's families in every homicide case, just so you, as a community, have an understanding of how long this process is going to go for. And we will, as the chief highlighted, keep everyone updated throughout that entire process. I promise you that. I also emphasize it because over the past few days, we've seen a tremendous outpouring of support for all the victims' families and for the community members devastated by the attack that took place on Monday. It's my hope and my request that that support for the victims' families and for everyone impacted by this horrific attack continue all throughout the next few months and until justice is done in this case and beyond. They're going to need that kind of help and support for years. So we've seen a tremendous outpouring of support over the last few days. We stand now in front of a patrol car that when we met with you on Tuesday, you could see it clearly. And now you see today how many flowers are placed here. You go to King Supers, you see the flowers and memorials that have been set up there. That support for the victims, it's my hope and I, certainly my intent to continue that throughout this entire process. The defendant's currently charged with 10 counts of murder in the first degree. He's charged with one count of attempted murder in the first degree. Additional charges of attempted murder in the first degree will be filed in the very near future. I will share with you that officers from the Boulder Police Department and the University of Colorado Boulder Police Department, so both Boulder PD and CU Boulder PD, responded very, very quickly to the report of shots being fired at the King Supers. Immediately after responding, they charged into the store. Their actions saved others, other civilians, from being killed. They charged into the store and immediately faced a very significant amount of gunfire from the shooter, who at first they were unable to locate. And they put their lives at risk. And that will be reflected in additional attempted murder charges that will be filed by the district attorney's office in the next couple weeks. In addition, I anticipate other charges will be filed in the weeks ahead, and as that information is finalized, we make them, that available to the media and to the community. As a result of the actions of law enforcement, there was significant danger to civilians who were still in the supermarket, and significant danger to the community. That danger ended because of the response of law enforcement. The police chief mentioned that there's an officer on administrative leave, and as she pointed out, that's standard protocol. Anytime we have an officer-involved shooting in Boulder County or anywhere in the state of Colorado, there's a certain protocol that we're required to follow. That protocol involves a multi-agency team of high-level detectives, investigators, and district attorney staff assigned to investigate the officer's use of physical force or deadly physical force against another individual. That protocol has been followed since the evening of the shooting. So by that, I mean that multi-agency team responded to the scene on Monday night and began their investigation. They've been investigating throughout the week. That multi-agency team, in order to maintain the integrity of the investigation, does not include anyone from the Boulder Police Department. It's investigators from other agencies. The District Attorney's Office will continue to oversee and support that investigation. The investigators met just yesterday in a different law enforcement facility elsewhere here in Boulder County to brief everyone on the status of that investigation. And once it's determined whether the officer was justified in firing his weapon or not, that decision and all the accompanying materials will be shared with the public and with the community and available through the district attorney's office. As in other mass tragedies and mass shootings here in Colorado, there has been tremendous interagency assistance and cooperation. I can't stress enough how many federal, state, and local partners have come together in response to this devastating attack. Standing behind me today, again, we stand shoulder to shoulder united in ensuring justice is done for the victims, their loved ones, and the Boulder community are the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, ATF, and various law enforcement agencies and partners from all around the metro jurisdiction. As the chief highlighted, we also have victim advocates from all around the metro jurisdiction responding to help the victims, families in this case, and connect with the many people who are being impacted by the shooter's actions on Monday. 
There's a lot of work that remains to be done. This just happened on Monday. But I will share with you that the investigation is progressing rapidly. All the agencies involved and committed to ensuring justice is done have been working incredibly hard day and night as they will throughout the weekend to make sure that all the information that can be learned about the shooter, the victims, the witnesses, King Supers, any connection between all of those becomes known and is available to the successful prosecution of the offender. But I really do want to highlight everyone, including Coroner Emma Hall and her staff, for how hard they've been working since this tragedy took place on Monday. I will also thank the other district attorneys from around the state of Colorado and around the country who've reached out to offer their support and assistance. And we greatly appreciate all the help and assistance that we're receiving here in Boulder from all around the state and all around the United States. To the victims, families, and to this community, I promise you that we work tirelessly to make sure that the right thing happens in that case. That is my firm and solemn commitment, and everyone in this building, everyone connected to this investigation shares that determination and focus. We'd be happy to take a few questions from members of the media now. Thank you. Well, have you ruled out the possibility that this could be linked to international terrorism or at least inspired by it? Thank you for your question. I do appreciate having the assistance and expertise of the FBI. As I've talked about, they have their evidence recovery team at the scene. They do an absolutely outstanding work at the crime scene. It's a very large scene. In answer to your question, the FBI, CBI, and all the law enforcement agents involved are doing a deep dive into the offender's background as well as the background of everybody involved in this incident, victims, witnesses, and so forth. And at this point, we don't have any particular information to share in that regard. Uh, we'll continue to look into it, and any connection we can find we'll make available to the public once we determine whether it's accurate or not. Is there, it's not not really that. Is there any indication that Elisa returned back to the Syria network? Uh, I don't have that information at this point. Do you think that a motive will ever, we're seeing in a lot of these shootings, sometimes motive isn't clear, they never learn a motive in some of these shootings. Do you think that's possible? It's a good question. I think the victims' families and the community are desperate to know the motive. We want to know the motive, and that's going to be the, the focus of all our efforts going forward. Whether or not we're able to determine it remains to be seen. As you stand here today, you, you, you can't say that you have a clear motive. It's still very early in the investigation, and that's going to remain a focus for us going forward. Yes. Chief, I mentioned that this was a very complex scene. Can you explain more about that, Chief? What makes this scene so complex? Sure, just the, um, the vastness of the scene. Um, you're talking about a, a huge supermarket, obviously, a huge parking lot, numerous vehicles. Um, it, it, it's just one of the most complex scenes I've ever, I've ever worked personally. Um, and that's why I'm so grateful that the FBI and their crime scene team is here and the state uh, CBI is here. It, it would take the Boulder Police Department weeks to get through a crime scene this complex. And so, thanks for your question. Chief, has the suspect, suspect talked to his attorneys? Has the suspect been to this supermarket before any indication as to why he chose this supermarket 30 miles away from where he lives? I, I, I really do wish I could tell you that. I just don't know. And that, like the DA said, that's the focus now of what we're trying to figure out. It's It'll be something haunting for, for all of us until we figure that out. And like someone said sometimes you just don't figure these things out um, but I am hoping that we will hey chief has the suspect talked to his attorneys or mr. Doherty can answer this question has the suspect uh, talked to his attorneys and made any kind of statements uh, outside of the court hearing that took place yesterday any conversations between the defendant and his counsel of course would be privileged and protected we would not have that information available to us Michael can you uh, say anything or give us any insight about any possible Further review of the, the purchase, the gun purchase that was made at the Eagle's Nest Armory in Arvada by the suspect. As the chief indicated in her remarks, uh, the suspect is believed to have used an AR-556 pistol that was purchased legally in Arvada, Colorado. He was also in possession of a 9mm handgun, and at this point in time, it's not believed that that was used during the incident. The ATF and FBI have done a tremendously thorough investigation into 
the guns that he had on him that day, as well as other firearms that might be connected to him, and that investigation is ongoing. What about the magazine? So I've spoken loud and clear over the years since becoming district attorney about the need for us to reduce gun violence in Colorado and throughout the United States. And at this point in time, those discussions and real action needs to continue. I'm going to remain very focused on this case. It is my primary focus. And today we stand just a few days after this mass shooting. And I'm going to keep the victims and their loved ones and the successful prosecution of this case as my focus. Are any of the victims hit by friendly fire? I do not. I do not believe so at this time. I'm obviously, we're going to be investigating this for weeks and weeks. But at this time, I just don't know that. You mentioned Chief, the, uh, do you know how many shots, shots were fired purchase? by the gunman? How many shots the gunman fired? I don't have that information, Michael. Do you have that information? I do have a preliminary idea as to how many shots were fired. We're not ready to confirm the number yet. It's a painstakingly thorough investigation being conducted by the FBI evidence recovery team. So to answer your question, yes, we do know the number, but we're not ready to finalize that number and confirm that it's accurate. If you picture a supermarket, picture all the shelves, all the products, everything, they're going through every single shelf, pulling everything off the shelves, looking in the walls, and that is gonna continue throughout the weekend. And once that crime scene is released, we'll be in a position to announce the number of uh, bullets that were fired by the shooter in this case. And Mr. Doherty, do you know if it was a high-capacity magazine that was used? Do you know if that was a legal magazine or if he maybe purchased a kit? So more information on the firearms would be released in the future, but at this point, this is all we're going to say on the firearms. We're still conducting a very thorough investigation with the help from the ATF and the FBI on the firearms that he had on him that day and other firearms within his possession. Michael, do you know if the suspect was shot by a police officer? Thank you for your question. I'm not going to talk about any particular witness. What I would say is if anybody out there has any information, I really encourage you to contact the Boulder Police Department or the FBI tip line with information. And for witnesses who have been cooperative with the investigation, we greatly appreciate that cooperation. It's going to allow us to ensure that justice is done in this case, and it's my hope that all witnesses will cooperate going forward. Uh, it was a grocery store in the middle of the day. So from your own experience, we've all been to the supermarket. That's how many people were there. And the defendant, uh, but for the actions of law enforcement and the quick thinking by a lot of the people in the supermarket, this would have been much, much worse in terms of the number of victims. In answer to your question, uh, it's been reported that there have been security concerns around the defendant. That's not exactly uh, unusual necessarily. I don't have any specific information, but there have been other cases where there might be a particular concern and the individuals moved to another facility. And that's all I have on that particular question. Do you have any information about a stop at a so your question is about a different individual after this mass shooting took place? Yeah. I don't have any specific information on that at this time. Was the shooter attacked by anyone in the store well? Did you say attacked? Yeah, did anyone oh. try I couldn't hear you, I'm sorry. Uh, we're still going through all the evidence, and there's still a lot of witness interviews to be conducted and video evidence to be examined. I think we'll take one more question and then wrap it up for today. Was there a shootout between the police and the suspect? So shots were fired between the police and the suspect, yes. And that's why there's a police officer on administrative leave now, which again is our standard protocol in Boulder County. Anytime an officer discharges his or her firearm, the Boulder Police Department puts that individual on administrative leave, and we initiate our officer-involved shooting protocol to conduct a thorough investigation and make sure that we determine whether the, the discharge of the firearm was uh, justified or not. The leg wound, is that from an officer's uh, shot? Officer's do you know at this time? Uh, it's too early for us to confirm that. Thank you. So I appreciate your question. I, I will just leave it with this, that law enforcement's response 
saved additional lives from being taken. And more detail will be shared in the weeks ahead. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to turn it back over to Dion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dion. They actually have another investigative briefing to get to, so they don't have time for any more questions. Um, I do have a fact sheet with some of the information. They talked about the number of agencies, number of tips, um, number of hours that, that um, investigators and detectives from all these agencies have put in. Um, but this is all the information we have for this morning's press conference. Thank you. All right, so once again, we were getting the latest here uh, thanks to a police chief and district attorney in Boulder as they continue to try to keep the public updated on the latest with the investigation. And again, that suspect has been charged uh, with uh, 10 counts of first degree murder. And here is some uh, video from yesterday. Again, that first uh, court appearance in person. And uh, the 21-year-old uh, Colorado man who is accused of gunning 10 people down in that supermarket uh, will be held without bail. That was, be, uh, that was ruled by a judge. And uh, he remains in custody at Boulder County Jail since uh, police arrested him at King Super's grocery store on Monday. Now, he's been, as I said, charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder. And uh, as of right now, one count of a first-degree attempted murder on a police officer. That could change, as we just heard uh, and had that latest update. Now, Ahmad. Alyssa uh, appeared in this hearing. He wore a mask and he only spoke once, responding yes to a question from the judge and did not enter a plea to the charges, uh, which will come later in the judicial process. And Boulder County District Attorney Michael Doherty said authorities plan to file more charges, but he did not elaborate, as uh, we heard. Uh, they said they're trying to uh, keep some of these uh, things that they've been finding in their investigation uh, private, just within the agency, uh, just so that they can try to keep this trial within Boulder County. And uh, the defense lawyer for Alyssa had asked for a mental health assessment to address his mental illness, but provided no details about what he might suffer from. Suspect's family has also told investigators they believe he was suffering from some type of mental illness, including delusions. Relatives described times when Alyssa told them uh, people were following or chasing him, which they said may have contributed to the violence. And an official told, uh, that's what an official told the Associated Press. Now, uh, he was a former high school wrestler. One of his uh, former teammates said that uh, he would act strangely sometimes. Uh, he would say sometimes, did you see that? Did you hear that? Uh, we wouldn't see anything. We would always thought he was messing with us. Uh, again, there, uh, Alyssa had bought a Ruger AR-556 pistol. Uh, which does resemble an AR-15 rifle with a slightly shorter stock on March 16th. That's just six days before 10 people, including a police officer, were killed in the supermarket. And this is all according to the arrest. Now, investigators did not immediately disclose where the uh, suspect had purchased this weapon, but did uh, this morning say it was in Nevada. And uh, we did see, again, on Monday when we were live with that breaking news, we did see uh, that uh, Alyssa was being walked out of the store with a, a bloody leg, and uh, he is suffering from a bullet wound to the leg. He was taken to the hospital on Monday for treatment uh, before being transferred to jail. And uh, Wednesday night, we had hundreds of mourners gather together in downtown Boulder to hold a candlelight vigil in remembrance of all those victims. We brought to you also the city council, which included uh, a virtual message, a virtual meeting. And uh, we did have the Colorado governor even uh, join in on that to share their respects. And lastly, Boulder police officer Eric Talley is among those victims. He was a veteran of the uh, Boulder Police Department, and his funeral is planned for Tuesday. So we'll continue to follow the latest on this uh, mass shooting as more continues to unfold with this investigation. Until that time, let's go to a quick two-minute break. We do have a few different live events that are going to be getting started here shortly. So going to send some of you off to a two-minute break. More to come here on the end of that break.
Welcome back here to News Now from Fox. Christy Larson here at the desk with you. Uh, we do have a few different stories we've been covering here today. Not only have we been keeping you updated on the latest with that investigation to that mass shooting in Boulder, Colorado, we've also been uh, tracking and uh, showing you some of that storm damage down in the south as uh, we did have multiple uh, tornadoes and severe storms move through our southern states. But uh, let's go out to another live event that's taking place. We do have Minnesota governor giving an update as they continue to uh, open up more uh, people to be able to get the COVID-19 vaccine. We're going to jump into that live right here for you on News Now from Fox. Listening to the experts, listening to the, the science and, and making sure that as we were Putting protocols in place, we were understanding what the real world implications of those were, how it would impact those providers, how it would impact um, the health outcomes that we were trying to get. And uh, I'm just incredibly pleased to be here uh, with you today and say a thank you to all of you. Uh, Minnesotans are doing what they need to do. You continue to wear masks, you continue to social distance, you continue to look out for each other. And right now, the two things that are really important, you continue to get tested um, to make sure that you don't have uh, COVID. And if you do, we put the protocols in place. And right now, the thing we're here to talk about is vaccinating. And as you can see on the opening slide, we're here to end this pandemic. We are on the doorstep of doing this. We're not done. Um, the analogy we used is a few nice days does not make spring, um, but certainly it is here. And today is one of those days where we can start to make the big leap forward. So just a couple things to know where we're at. Building out the nation's uh, leading vaccination effort um, has been a combination of the work of Commissioner Malcolm and her team's local public health, our private partners, uh, our pharmacies, and just to be very candid, millions of Minnesotans who are looking out not only for their own health, but for their neighbor's health by rolling up their sleeves and taking the vaccine. And what that's done is, is Minnesota is able to move vaccines out faster than any state in the nation this week. We ranked number one. We built this system to be wide, diverse, meaning that it was in all corners of the state. It had many levels of where you could get the vaccine from. And we were focused on the things that mattered. We were focusing on vaccinating for impact and health impact. That meant getting the healthcare workers in line. It meant making sure our seniors were in line, our long-term care facilities, critical workers, those with underlying health conditions, the things that we knew would vaccinate and take down the death tolls and would reduce the number of people ending up in hospitals. And at this point in time, Minnesota, we're leading the nation with 85, 80 percent of 65 and above taking this vaccine. That's the entire population. I'm sure there's some of you uh, and some of your relatives who are still down south and um, we're getting the folks continue to get those vaccines and over 66 percent of our uh, educators and child care workers, which has enabled us to get over 90% of our students back into uh, in-person learning while protecting those folks, both the teachers and the support staff around them in schools. This is a phenomenal numbers. These are things that wouldn't have happened without all of your help. These are things that would not have happened without having a very robust vaccination uh, ecosystem. We built this thing, as, as the saying goes, skating to where the puck was going to be. And the puck is coming next week in the form of a dramatic increase in the number of vaccines that the federal government is able to deliver. I spent some time last week, not only with the White House, but with uh, Alex Gorski, the CEO of uh, Johnson & Johnson's, explaining this process. And I just want to be clear, um, this is, uh, this is some tough science that's going on. It has been researched for years, um, and it takes some patience to get these things out. And that's why in the beginning, in December and January, everybody's, where are the vaccines? Where are the vaccines? They're in the pipeline. They are now coming, and we're going to see that next week. Because of that, the news that I think all of us have been waiting for, all Minnesotans age 16 and above will be eligible next Tuesday, March 30th, to receive their vaccines. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am for the state of Minnesota. Uh, I can tell you that we have built the infrastructure, both the tech infrastructure, but more importantly, the distribution system to get vaccines out. To use our analogy, we created a lane, and that initial lane was to take care of folks in long-term care and our health providers who are on the very front lines of this. And then we started to add more lanes to that freeway. The freeway is running nearly at full speed and on Tuesday it will. But I want to just be very clear. That fast lane on the left 
is still for seniors 65 and above. And as long as someone's in that, they are being prioritized to get that. But what this allows us to do, and with the number of vaccines the state of Minnesota is getting, if no one's in that lane, our providers will move to the next lane. If no one's in that lane, they will move to the next lane. And what we want to do is we want to keep the queue loaded so that we go for that goal that we need to get to 80% or above of our population vaccinated to get that immunity that we need to truly turn back to all of the things we love so much. So this was a, a, a modification of the chart we showed you. And I told you at the time about six weeks ago that that, that timeline could move to the left meaning it could move sooner, dependent on what the federal government was able to do. And at this point in time, each and every week, the federal government has been able to give a little bit more of an allotment, and now we're going to see next week an even bigger allotment. Now, I want to just caution folks. Um, as, uh, as Mr. Gorski at Johnson & Johnson said, this isn't building widgets. This is nature, and it takes some time to grow these vaccines, to validate these vaccines, to package these vaccines, to get them to the states and get them in arms. Now, the good news is, when they get to the state of Minnesota, they get out faster than any place in the country. But we need to understand, we need to take a little patience. This isn't an absolute guarantee, but we're confident enough now with the supply chain that's, that is coming from the federal government and our distribution system that we need to load all of these uh, queues with folks in it. Now, I would caution, and Commissioner Malcolm will caution, um, you'll probably hear Dr. Jacob caution you, this does not mean you're necessarily going to get this next week. It means you're in line. And we'll talk to you about, if you haven't done it, um, go to that connector website. Get your name in there so that you'll get notified. You may get a call from a local pharmacy. You may get a call from your doctor. You may hear that there's a state vaccine clinic near you, and it's open for anyone for appointments. Stay on top of that. Help others who don't uh, who, who might not know how this works. Help a friend do this. You now have the opportunity, if you look at this, those priority groups are still going. Most of the ones on the far left, health personnel and long-term care residents, those are done. But if there's still a few in there, maybe they were hesitant to take it in the first place, they are still prioritized. And you move to the next. Pre-K and um, educators. We know they're still out there to get that. It's just simply that that demand is not as high so what we're not going to do is stop and wait till one lane stops dead and then add another lane. We're just continuing to add on, and that's what we've done. So for those of you out there now, families, you can go together and get everybody vaccinated. I would make a, a, an appeal to where we're seeing some of the highest spread happening in our younger people. Take your roommates and go and get the vaccine. Um, keeping in mind, there are no barriers, there's no costs. You don't have to answer the questions about this. I just wanna make sure that you understand when you get the vaccine, not only are you protecting yourself, you're protecting that roommate, you're protecting that family, and you're protecting the person who might, the person who might inadvertently get it through asymptomatic spread. This is how we break the back of this pandemic. And so, um, these vaccines are coming. We're quickly getting doses out. We know that more are coming next week. That allocation is there. The good news is, Minnesota, we built a system that can absorb a large number of vaccines coming into the state of the Minnesota and can get out quickly. But again, vaccines and vaccines on the shelves do nothing. Vaccines in arms are how we beat this thing. So this is your opportunity. If you haven't done it, I hope you're going onto that website right now. Get on the Minnesota Connector, get signed up. If you contact your, uh, your local uh, health provider, uh, think if your local clinics or your local pharmacy, there's all kinds of opportunities. We are expanding as we did this week into Mankato and other areas, state run sites. Um, right as we speak right now, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan is down in Worthington, where over the last week, we have vaccinated tens of thousands of those critical workers in food processing plants and taken it right to them. And we're continuing and will continue to work with our business sector to make it as easy as possible to bring in these vaccination sites, to work with them, to make sure that people can do this as easy as going to work and getting that shot and being able to, uh, um, to continue on. Those are all things that we need to continue to do. We've got a ways to go, obviously, to get to 80%, but the infrastructure is there. The vaccines are coming. Minnesotans are showing a willingness to get this done, and this is how we beat it. We couple getting the vaccine with just the basic protocols. Continue to wear your mask. I think all of you saw here um, two weeks ago, um, I was exposed and... Uh, People at an event were exposed, Commissioner Malcolm and others, to an individual who, again, it's many cases no fault of your own, 
contracted COVID, but knew to get tested, knew to alert folks at that point in time, and then the system kicked in where the COVID aware app notified people who might have been next to that person for 15 minutes within six feet. And then we were able to notify others who were in the vicinity. And I'm, I'm glad to say, as I walked out of uh, my home today for the first time in 10 days out of quarantine, not a single other person was infected by that case. That's how you beat COVID. It has no opportunity to spread. It has no opportunity to create a variant and it gets stopped dead in its tracks. None of those things stop. We have the most robust testing system in the country. Use it. It's free. It's easy. It's right there. If you think you got a sniffle, you think you might have been exposed, you think, you know what, I haven't been tested in a week or so, I'm going to go down and do it. That act and then the subsequent protocols afterwards is how we beat this. Had we done this and had the capacity last year at this time, we would not see 500 plus thousand people dead. We would have not seen tens of millions of infected and we could have ended this thing sooner. Now we have that protocol, those resources coupled with vaccines. This is the sprint, Minnesotans. This is, we have to outrun those variants. We have to stop the spread that's out there and Minnesota is one of the states where it is gaining. But the good news is we're countering it with an aggressive vaccine effort. And um, so uh, it's a great day, Minnesota. It's a good opportunity for you to get in line. We're beating the federal uh, guidelines by over a month. Again, we're leading the nation in getting these things out. Minnesotans are leading the nation in willingness to take the vaccine. And now we're continuing to think about creative ways to make sure that equity is a part of this and making sure that we take it, in some cases, right to people's homes to let them get the vaccine if they have uh, barriers to getting that. And I just want to say, um, of a year of hard work, of a thoughtfulness that went around when we heard the vaccines were coming in December, of uh, building a system system which um, we understood would take folks to watch and see what happened with this system that we built around vaccines, um, knowing that, and we said today, when we have enough vaccines to vaccinate everybody, we need to be ready to go on that very day that we hear that. Well, that day has arrived, and a large part of that thanks goes to, uh, to Commissioner Jan Malcolm of Minnesota Department of Health. Commissioner Malcolm. Well, thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Or good morning, I guess it still is. As Governor Walz said, today really is a hopeful day, another hopeful day for Minnesotans. Very soon, more people are going to be eligible to get their vaccine and the deep peace of mind that can come with that. The three vaccines authorized in the United States right now really, truly are lifesavers. Each one of them will protect you against COVID-19 and, as the Governor has said, help us get to the end of this pandemic together. I want you to know that you can be confident in these vaccines, and I'm sure Dr. Jacob will speak to this as well. When it's your turn, I hope you will get your shot. Getting vaccinated is safe, and it's highly effective at preventing especially severe cases of COVID-19. Every vaccine authorized for use right now has undergone rigorous and actually historically large clinical trials, testing their effectiveness and their safety. In these trials, all three of these vaccines were shown to have an extremely high rate of effectiveness in preventing severe illness, hospitalizations, and death. And while some people do experience side effects, hopefully quite mild and, and limited in time immediately or within the, the next couple of days after getting their shot, these shots have been shown to be extremely safe for recipients. Getting vaccinated is going to get us back to doing the things that we love and the things that we have missed. I'm sure you, uh, you noticed uh, the good news that the Centers for Disease Control has put out guidance saying that fully vaccinated groups of people can get together indoors again. And we at the Minnesota Department of Health have, of course, adopted that guidance as well. That means families can share a meal. Minnesotans can visit their neighbors and friends and grandparents can safely hug their grandchildren. These are the small, meaningful personal connections that COVID has taken from us, but we can get them back once we all get our shots. I just quickly want to also reinforce a very important point that the governor made about the fact that we are going to continue to prioritize vaccinating for impact and equity. So even though the eligibility will expand to include everyone above the age of 16 starting next Tuesday, we are going to continue to make sure that the people who are at greatest risk are at the head of the line, so to speak. 
the governor's analogy of those freeway lines moving is, is exactly right. We have explicitly directed our health care providers uh, to be looking for their, their patients who are at higher risk, and we will continue to put special effort into those essential uh, workforce sectors, as the governor mentioned as well. So just want everyone to understand that being eligible on Tuesday doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be getting your vaccine in these next few days, but we're all in line. And, uh, and, and this is all about creating the flexibility so that as vaccine providers get through these next priority populations, they can move immediately and flexibly uh, to provide the, the doses to any in their community who are ready and eager to take them. I would like to um, uh, just share with you a really good success story here about how getting vaccinated protects yourself and your loved ones. And we've seen this. We talked yesterday on our briefing call, media briefing call, that every resident in assisted living, uh, in assisted living or our skilled nursing facilities and every caretaker in those settings, 2,000 long-term care settings in Minnesota, every resident, every caretaker has now had the opportunity to be fully vaccinated. Now, as we've seen really good um, uptake of these vaccines, particularly among residents, and it's growing among staff as well, what we've seen is that COVID-19 cases in these long-term care facilities have declined fully 96% from where they were in November and December, and COVID-19 deaths in that population have declined by 97%. And as a result of that, We've now had been able to open up activities and visitation, returning quality of life to Minnesota's long-term care facilities, residents and families. For residents to be able to safely see their families and go on, on outings outside of their residence into the community is, is life-changing. Hope is returning to these facilities after a very frightening and stressful year of coping with COVID-19. Simply put, these vaccines work. These data show how quickly they can work. And we can replicate this statewide in every population group if everybody gets the vaccine when they are able to do so. So I encourage all Minnesotans to take this life-saving opportunity, help yourself, help your family, help your community to recover and get us on the other side of this pandemic. With that, Governor, back to you. Well, thank you, Commissioner Malcolm. And, and this slide is really powerful. That is what will happen in the general public if all of us get this vaccine. And we have that potential to do that very, very quickly now to be able to move through that. And I just want to, as I turn it over to, um, to someone we've leaned on for practical knowledge, for someone who's been involved in this, as we said, making these decisions based on, um, on the science and the practicality, I'm pleased to, uh, to turn it over to Dr. Abe Jacobs of M Health Fairview, who has been an uh, incredible partner with us. Dr. Jacob. Good morning, everyone. My name is Abe Jacob, Chief Quality Officer for M Health Fairview. Um, on a personal note, I want to say that just two months ago, I couldn't hug my 86-year-old dad or 82-year-old mom. Today, I can. It is a remarkable story for all of us who have that uh, privilege to be vaccinated. Um, I want to really uh, speak to our experience as a large health system. Uh, I think as Minnesotans, we can be proud that Minnesota ranks at the top or near the top in terms of percentages of vaccines uh, administered that have been allocated. It is a remarkable accomplishment. Uh, our health system, M Health Fairview, has administered nearly 150,000 vaccines, first doses. It's been a remarkable effort. I want to personally thank our leadership, our frontline staff, our volunteers, who've been all in in this effort to end this pandemic. Um, I couldn't be more proud to be a, a part of that group, but really a part of all the health systems who've been a part of this effort. I want to speak to a few things about our experience in giving that many vaccines. Number one, as Commissioner Malcolm said, these vaccines are safe. They're very safe. We've, we've been amazed at how we've seen a remarkably low level of adverse events, especially things that have required uh, our people who've been vaccinated to have to go to the hospital. I mean, very, very, very small numbers. Uh, and so we're encouraged by that. Uh, what we've seen is that the hesitancy has gone down as a result of people hearing that news from their loved ones or their neighbors that they get vaccinated. They've done really well with it. Number two, these vaccines are effective. Uh, again, when we started this effort, our first goal was to reduce deaths and reduce hospitalizations. 
And we've seen that in those who've been vaccinated, that's exactly what we've seen. Uh, in our uh, hospitalized patients, uh, the average age has shifted from the 60s down to the 50s. And, and frankly, that's because they haven't been vaccinated yet. When we do audits of people who are hospitalized, uh, hard, almost zero to barely very small numbers are in those who've been fully vaccinated. So that tells us that these vaccines are working. And again, as Commissioner Malcolm said, in our long-term care facilities and the Ebenezer facilities, we're seeing the same numbers that are reflected in the state. Those numbers are plummeting. Um, it's given a lot of sense of safety for our healthcare workers and our residents who live in those uh, facilities uh, to again, begin uh, to get closer to normal again. And the, the last point I wanna make is that, uh, just a point of caution. Um, this is a race against the variants. Uh, what we have seen is an uptake in our hospitalizations in the last few weeks, and it tells us uh, that we know that despite being vaccinated, there's a small chance, a smaller chance that you can still get COVID. Uh, you're much more likely to be asymptomatic with it, uh, but we know that, that there's still a possibility you can be infectious. And so we still want to have an abundance of caution until we get to herd immunity. We should still be wearing our masks. You know, we got to remain our social, keep our social distance. Uh, we just got to be careful uh, because we know the variance is an issue and we want to get people vaccinated as fast as we can. So again, uh, my gratitude to you, Governor, to Commissioner Malcolm uh, for doing this as safely and as fast as we've been able to do it. Uh, again, it's a great day uh, in Minnesota that we can expand uh, our vaccination tiers to include more Minnesotans. It's, it's going to be a, a really good spring and an even better summer. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Jacob. Well, thank you, Dr. Jacob, and thank you again for all of our, uh, our health providers who have stood on the front lines of this. Um, this is the light at the end of the tunnel, Minnesota. This is the, uh, the time we've been waiting for. Uh, this infrastructure that has been built, uh, as Dr. Jacob said, is a testament to Minnesota's collaborative efforts, public-private partnerships, the ability to pivot as situations change, but always putting Minnesota's health at the forefront. And what we're seeing is, is those folks who measure these things independently outside, this was the method that needed to get us to this point. And now that deep, rich infrastructure is out there to be able to deliver vaccines. The vaccines are going to be coming in in much greater numbers um, starting next week. And on Tuesday, here's what I'm going to need from you. I need your help, Minnesota. We beat this pandemic with you. We beat it by you going and getting the vaccine. Um, if you've got a friend, a neighbor, a family member, they're not quite sure about this, um, and you're pretty certain they're not going to listen to me when I tell them to do it, maybe they'll listen to you. This is why talk to your friends. Get out there and make this conversation. Have this conversation with friends and neighbors and others to get them to get this done. We need to be, and I think we have the opportunity to be, first state in the country to get to 80% of our people vaccinated. Let's set those high goals. We've done it all along. We said we would care for the most vulnerable. We said we would keep as many people alive till we got to the end of this. We would try and reduce infections because we don't know what the long-term impacts are. And we would make sure that we were there to provide economic and other support to folks who felt the brunt of this. We've got a lot of work yet to do, but we've got the tools to beat it. So Minnesota, starting on Tuesday, get in that line, get registered, turn over whatever stone you need to and talk to everybody out there, but let's get vaccinated. Let's see the end of this. And I'm just, for all of you, we're within two weeks of the Twins opener. We've got a really bright summer ahead of us. We got some work to do together. Wear the mask, social distance, continue to test and vaccinate. So thanks, Minnesota, and have a great weekend. And thank you to all of our viewers. So once again, we were listening in as uh, Governor Waltz did announce that they are now opening up starting on Tuesday, those uh, eligibility is for 16 and older in Minnesotans to be able to get that COVID-19 vaccine. I know I've said it before, I'm from Minnesota. That's where my whole family is. I, uh, we do have a few people in the family who've already been vaccinated, uh, but the others who weren't in that uh, senior category, who weren't in the health risk category, they're very excited to get themselves signed up for that COVID-19 vaccine. All right, we are just a couple minutes away from the next top of the hour when we're gonna kind of be re racked giving you some more uh, news that's been happening here across the country. What I want to do is uh, head out uh, to uh, a quick break for some of you. Before I do send you away, though, I just want to note uh, something that is going to be coming up here on our News Now from Fox Stream. Uh, we do have our uh, senators from the Republican side. There's 18 of them who have traveled down to Texas. They are touring the border. 
I'm going to be looking at the construction where the wall has been ordered to uh, stop being built. They're going to be going into facilities. Uh, this is being led by Senator Cruz, along with uh, many other representatives, U.S. Senators on the Republican side uh, from all across the states. They're going to be holding a, a press conference after their tour. They're going to be holding a press conference, and I'm expecting it to be pretty fiery. You can always expect that from uh, Ted Cruz, but uh, they're going to be talking about, of course, the Biden administration had been been denying the requests uh, to uh, have access to that uh, area. And uh, just a reminder, uh, now they finally are being let in. Media, though, had not been allowed to be going into these facilities. It's been something that they've been talking about a lot all week long as that border crisis continues to build. Um, so uh, we'll be expecting that here very shortly on our News Now from Fox Stream. Let's go, as I mentioned, into a quick two-minute break, and we'll have more coming your way at the top of the hour. And just want to say thanks again for being here with us on News Now from Fox. I'll uh, be uh, giving you guys some more information about what to expect here on our stream here in just about another uh, 35 seconds. And uh, right now we're taking a live look down in Texas. Uh, we're expecting a press conference shortly from some Democratic representatives down in the Lone Star State at the border. And good morning and thanks for being here with us on News Now from Fox, taking a live look as uh, we get ready for a press conference with some of our Democratic representatives who have been uh, touring down along the border, a facility where uh, there's been a number of unaccompanied children crossing the border and now uh, families have uh, been waiting to be reunited with those kids uh, while their asylum asylum cases are uh, being uh, deliberated about and this coming at a time too when uh, we do have 18 
of the Republican side, senators who are also down in Texas at the border. They're not only looking at that wall construction, but they're also touring facilities at this time. They're expecting a press conference coming up here in just about an hour and a half. So we'll be getting both sides uh, down at the border now that the Biden administration has finally allowed uh, some of these leaders into these facilities to go and check out the border crisis situation. So when we do have those live events come up, they're going to take uh, priority here on our stream and we'll be bringing them to you here. Again, that one uh, that we do have with some representatives on the Democratic side is supposed to be getting underway here very shortly. But until that time, hello, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're joining us from. I'm Christy Larson, and I'm uh, joining you here live from the Phoenix area as we continue to keep you up to date on a number of stories, not only the border crisis, but uh, ones that have been happening all across the country. And yesterday, we uh, around this time, we're waiting for President Biden to step out and make his very first official news conference. Now, he uh, was grilled about the border crisis. He had mentioned that they are working hard, uh, but this is not a new issue. He said every administration has had to deal with with uh, immigrants being uh, crossing the border illegally and the numbers increasing year after year. So he did put a lot of blame on the Trump administration. And now uh, we do have our White House press secretary, Jen Psaki. She is answering questions from the media. You can surely expect uh, more questions, not only about the border crisis, but of course on some of the other topics Joe Biden, our president, had uh, talked about yesterday. So let's jump into that. And then as soon as I do see, uh, like I said, some of those uh, uh, representatives step up to the podium. We'll head down to that Texas border right here for you on News Now from Fox. Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. We tried to make this outdoors. It was not technologically possible yet. One day, maybe. Uh, I have a couple of items for you at the top. Uh, today is a part of our Help Us Here tour. The Vice President and Education Secretary Cardona are traveling to New Haven, Connecticut to emphasize a bold and historic achievement of the American Rescue Plan, cutting child poverty in half. In Connecticut, they will hold a listening session at a Boys and Girls Club and visit a child development center. Uh, the American Rescue Plan makes the single biggest investment in child care since World War II. This is uh, hopefully going to help bring more women back into the workforce and address what the vice president and the president have both called a crisis. It increases the child tax credit from $2,000 to $3,000 per child and $3,600 for children under the age of six. It also gives families an additional tax credit to help out child care costs for children younger than 13. Uh, as you all have probably seen, uh, there have been uh, some tornadoes in the, the south. We are monitoring those closely. The severe weather outbreak that's impacting, of course, the southeastern part of the United States. We extend our deepest condolences to the people in Alabama and Mississippi who lost loved ones as a result of the severe weather outbreak. Uh, we continue to be in close communication with state and local officials, stand at the ready should a need for federal assistance be made or be required. We have not received requests at this point yet, but we stand ready to respond to those should we receive those requests. Uh, next week, uh, this is a, we will update the week ahead. This does not have a lot in it. So, uh, but next week the president will continue laying out his vision for the future of our country. Um, on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, he will not be traveling. He will be doing public events at the White House. We'll have more details of those in the coming days. And on Wednesday, as all of you know, he will travel to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he will deliver a speech, laying out more details of his plan to build the economy back better. That, Josh. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Georgia signed into law new restrictions on voting. President Biden has expressed his moral outrage over that. Uh, there's legislation in Congress, but does the administration plan to take any executive actions or file any lawsuits opposing these new laws? Well, the administration has taken executive actions on voting rights, uh, and of course we will continue to review options in that regard. I will say we expect to have a statement from the president uh, on these, these voting laws, this voting law, I should say, that passed in Georgia. Uh, he's worried about uh, how this initiative uh, how, how it, this initiative sets in place, the, uh, allowing states, uh, to preventing states, I should say, to bring water to people standing in, the, in line, waiting to vote, deciding what you're going to end vote, that deciding to end voting at five o'clock when working people are just getting off of work, making it more challenging, not easier to vote, uh, deciding that there will be no absentee ballots under the most rigid circumstances, uh, like 
the late Congressman John Lewis said, there's nothing more precious than the right to vote and speak up. And the president certainly believes that. Um, there are pieces of legislation, as you noted, um, but that he is watching closely, that he will be engaging with members of Congress on, including the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act to make it easier for all eligible Americans uh, to, have, to vote, to have access to the ballot box, and to prevent attacks on the sacred right to vote. I'll also note that when he was in Georgia just two weeks ago, he met with uh, Stacey Abrams while he was there, and he will also continue to encourage and engage with outside leaders and activists on steps they can take. Uh, obviously, there's a range of groups and organizations that uh, may take legal action, that may, will, be, will be leading in activism. Uh, some of that is going to be more appropriate from outside of the White House. And then uh, two more questions. Uh, Japan's prime minister has said he expects to invite President Biden to attend the Tokyo Olympics when he comes to the White House. That would be a big statement about the status of the pandemic worldwide. Does the president plan to accept that invite? He hasn't received it yet. I want to go to the Olympics. Does that matter? Um, as we've said, uh, we respected the decision to delay the games last summer. Uh, we understand the careful considerations that the Japanese government and the International Olympic Committee are weighing as they prepare for the Tokyo Olympics this summer. Uh, the government of Japan has stressed that public health remains the central priority as they plan to host the games. We, of course, look forward to welcoming the Prime Minister to Washington soon. The date has not been formally set yet. Um, and beyond that, uh, I don't have any predictions on uh, what the President's travel will look like this summer. And then there's this ship stuck in the Suez Canal. Has the U.S. offered to help or provide any kind of assistance? to resolve the problem? Uh, we are tracking the situation very closely. Uh, we understand that Egyptian officials are working to remove the tanker as soon as possible and continue traffic. As part of our active, I should say, diplomatic dialogue with Egypt, we've offered U.S. assistance to Egyptian authorities to help reopen the canal. We are consulting with our Egyptian partners about how we can best support their efforts. Uh, so those conversations are ongoing, and hopefully we'll have more to say about that soon. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you. Uh, we heard what the president said yesterday about Afghanistan. When do you think he will formally postpone the May 1 withdrawal date? Uh, well, uh, first let me convey the president has not made a decision uh, at this point. Uh, as he said yesterday, it would be tough to meet the May 1st deadline for full withdrawal for logistical reasons. That's consistent what, with what Secretary of State Tony Blinken also said in Brussels earlier this week. Uh, any uh, withdrawal plan will be informed by consultation with key leaders within the administration and the thinking of our partners and allies, which is, of course, what our Secretary of State is working on doing. Uh, our commitment is to bringing a responsible end to the conflict, removing our troops from harm's way, ensuring that Afghanistan can never again become a haven for terrorists that would threaten the United States or any of our allies. But right now, we're consulting with our allies and partners, and the President has not yet made a decision. When do you think he will decide, Jen? Is, is it imminent? Or? Uh, well, obviously, uh, May 1st is coming soon, uh, but I don't have any timeline on it when his decision will be made. And separately, on, on North Korea, when, when do you expect your review of that policy to be completed? Uh, well, we are in the final stages of our intensive multi-stakeholder North Korea policy review. Uh, and we're, of course, discussing our review with national security advisors of South Korea and Japan at our trilateral dialogue uh, coming up next week. And those consultations are an important part of our review process. Go ahead. Thanks, uh, Jen. Uh, first, I want to follow on the Suez. How concerned is the U.S. about the blockage uh, and its effect on global commerce, trade, goods getting to the U.S. and other places? Well, we do see some potential impacts on energy markets uh, from the role of the Suez Canal as a key bi bi-directional transit route for oil. Uh, and obviously, that's one of the reasons we offered assistance from the United States, and our, we are in close consultation with the uh, Egyptians about that. We're going to continue to monitor market conditions and will respond appropriately if necessary, uh, but it is something we're watching closely. And then on the pandemic, uh, Dr. Redfield, the former CDC director, said this morning that he believes that the virus originated from the lab in Wuhan. Does President Biden have any views on where the virus may have originated, or has the U.S. come to a conclusion on that yet? 
Well, as you know, uh, the WHO is examining this and we'll be releasing a report soon. Uh, we'll review that report once it's available. Uh, we continue to learn more about the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, including its origins, so we can better prepare for future crises. I know Dr. Walensky addressed this, and I think Dr. Fauci did as well uh, this morning, and we'll look closely at that information when it's available. Are the president's views being informed by that WHO report or, or his advisors? I mean, by his medical, he... health and medical advisors, certainly. And so they'll review. They will be, of course, the people reviewing the reports um, and more data when it becomes available. And then last one on uh, the forced labor in, in Xinjiang and in, in China. Uh, some companies have come under pressure from the Chinese government, and some uh, retailers have actually dropped pledges not to use products made with forced labor from that region. So uh, you know, what is the U.S. doing to stop or deter China from making those kind of threats against companies that have resulted in this problem? Well, we certainly have been watching this issue closely, as you well know, and we've taken our own uh, strong actions in order to prevent China from profiting off of its horrific human rights abuses in Xinjiang and to stop imports of products made with forced labor in China. Um, American consumers and consumers everywhere deserve to know that their goods are that the goods they are buying are not made with forced labor and many companies are standing up for consumers rights. The international community in our view should oppose China's weaponizing of private companies dependence on its markets to stifle free expression and inhibit ethical business practices. So it is something we are watching closely. We have, of course taken our own action. I would expect that uh, state and commerce will have more to say on this later today. Just one quick follow up though. It's because it seems like you've been having this message out there for for the first couple months of this administration, but it's China only seems more emboldened to threaten these companies. So what more can be done from the White House to try to deter them from making these threats? Well, we can work with our international partners, uh, obviously, as I conveyed, uh, on how we're going to push back on China's efforts to weaponize uh, private companies. And we can convey publicly, as we are now, and of course engage with private sector entities about these efforts. But a lot of that action would happen from commerce and in some cases the State Department. And again, I expect they'll have more specifics to say later today on this. Um, go ahead, Caitlin. A few questions uh, on the WHO investigation that's coming out. Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, said a few months ago that they had deep concerns about the way that investigation was being conducted. Did they still have those deep concerns? Uh, in part because there was a lack of transparency and there was a lack of, we weren't ensured that we were, would have access to the data available. So uh, there was a delay. They actually delayed the release of that report, which we were encouraged by. We'll have to take a look at it and make sure we have access to the underlying information. So what happens if the report comes out and President Biden is not satisfied with it? Not satisfied with the report? Well, we've also, we've also called for an international um, investigation and look into uh, what's what's happened uh, and the origin, not just the origin, I should say, the uh, lack of transparency uh, from uh, the Chinese. We have reinstituted or reengaged uh, with uh, through staffing of our uh, of our uh, team on the ground in Beijing. So uh, we'll see what the report says, where we have concerns. We'll look at the underlying data if we have access to that, and then we'll have to make a determination through an interagency process on what's next. And just to get some clarity on yesterday, are we, should we still be expecting executive orders from the president on gun measures? Yes. Or what's, what do you, like a month from now, what do you think the time frame is? I, I can't give you an exact time frame, in part because they have to go through a, a review process, which is something that uh, we do from here. Uh, you know, I will note that, um, you know, when we, when the president was the vice president in the Obama-Biden administration, he helped put in place 23 executive actions to combat gun violence. It's one of the levers that we can use, that any federal government, any president can use to help address uh, the prevalence of gun violence and uh, address community safety around the country. Uh, at the same time, he continues to believe that there is an opportunity to uh, engage with Congress. There are two background bill background check bills that um, are have been proposed, have been introduced, have been working their way through. Uh, there have also been legislation introduced to ban an assault weapon, ban assault weapons. But he also believes that there is an opportunity and, and sometimes that the best path forward is working through states. Uh, and there has been uh, progress made. We've seen over the last several years, 20 states now have extended background checks. 19 states have red flag laws. Seven states now have assault weapons bans. We know they work, uh, and so we have to address this epidemic, address the threat of gun violence uh, across many uh, avenues, and he will, uh, he's committed to doing that. Okay, and then also, does he have a reaction to the Georgia state representative who was arrested overnight when knocking on the Georgia governor's door as he was signing that election law? 
I think a anyone who saw that video uh, would have been uh, deeply concerned uh, by uh, the actions that were taken uh, by law enforcement to arrest her when she simply, by the video that was provided, uh, seemed to be knocking on the door to, uh, to see if she could uh, watch a bill being signed into law. The, the, larger con the largest concern here, obviously um, beyond her uh, being treated in the manner she was, which is of course of great concern, is the law that was put into place, which again, the president will, will have a statement from the president, uh, I expect later this afternoon on. Uh, it should not be harder, it should be easier to vote. Uh, we should not l put limitations in place. People should be able to vote from home. They should be able to use absentee ballots. Uh, there should be a range of uh, restrictions that are undone, not put back in place. And so uh, that's a great concern. One, he certainly shares uh, with, the, uh, with the elected official who was arrested. Does he plan to reach out to her? I don't have any calls to preview for you. If, if he does, I, I will certainly uh, provide an update to all of you. Thank you, Jen. Uh, a couple follow-ups on yesterday. The president said he thinks the filibuster is a legacy of the Jim Crow era. Did he think that it was a legacy of the Jim Crow era in 2005 when he defended the filibuster and said altering Senate rules to help one political fight or another could become standard operating procedure, which in my view would be disastrous? Well, Peter, one of the things he talked about yesterday was the fact that between 1917 and 1971, the filibuster was used about 58 times. Last year, last year alone, uh, it was used five times that many. It is not being used for the intended purpose. It is being abused. And yes, there are scenarios as it, as it relates to voting rights where it is, uh, it is oppressing, it is, uh, it, is, it is allowing for systematic racism in the country. So that's the concern he was expressing. And a follow on that, there are some concerns on the right that if you get rid of the filibuster, it effectively means one party rule. So is that what the president was getting at when he was asked about 2024 and he said, I have no idea if there will be a Republican party? Well, that, that certainly wasn't what he was getting at, given as part of his answer, he conveyed that his objective and his hope is to work with Republicans. He wants to get work done for the American people. He wants to put in place solutions, put people back to work, get the pandemic under control, make voting easier and more accessible. And it's really on Republicans in Congress to decide if they're gonna be part of the solution or if they're be going to be part of obstruction. So he's leaving it up to them to make the decision on what role they wanna play in history. On the border, the president said yesterday, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of people coming to the border and crossing are being sent back. but. Only 13% of the 13,000 families that tried to cross last week were sent back, according to Axios. So where do we get a majority out of 13%? The vast majority of adults are being sent back. Okay, so the family units, 87% of them are being taken into the United States to either be resettled or await, uh, await their hearings. Uh, I'm just curious, 87% in the country of the family units is not a majority being sent back. A majority of adults, which every adult is not a part of a family unit, as I'm sure you're fully tracking, right. um, and tens of thousands of people are coming to our border. We know that. Um, and so the majority of adults are being turned away. Uh, our policy remains the same. Uh, we are implementing Section 42. As the President touched on and I touched on a little bit earlier this week, uh, we, there are capacity issues in Mexico, which we are in discussions with them about addressing. And they are not uh, in a position to accept and take the families that they have in the past. So that's part of the diplomatic discussions that we're having. Okay, and just one more about yesterday. Uh, we noticed, starting at the end of the campaign, and then into the transition and here at the White House. Anytime that the president has an event where he is given a list of reporters to call on, Fox is the only member of the five network TV pool that has never been on the list in front of the president. And I'm just curious if that is an official administration policy. We're here having a conversation, aren't we? Yes, but and do I president, take questions from you every time you come to the briefing room? Yes, but I'm has the president taken questions from you since you came in since you he came into office? Unfortunately, yes or no? Only when I have shouted after he goes through his whole list. And the president has been very generous with his time with Fox. I'm just curious about this list that he has given. So the only member of the five network pool never on it dating back to when he resumed in-person events in Wilmington during the end of the campaign. Well, I would say that 
I'm always happy to have this conversation with you, even about your awesome socks you're having on today, you wearing today, and have a conversation with you, even when we disagree. The president's taking your questions, and I'm looking forward to doing Fox News Sunday this Sunday for the third time in the last few months. I think we got to move on because we got limited time. Go ahead, Kristen. Jen, thank you. Uh, the president talked about the importance of. All right, things getting a little bit fired up and heated there, as uh, you heard. Uh, Fox News upset because they once again were not on that list as President Biden had went and called. Uh, different reporters to ask their questions. So they were just curious as to why. And uh, Jen Psaki saying, I'm always uh, answering your questions. So it looks like uh, there could be more conversations on that uh, to happen later. All right, I want to head out to a quick two minute break. And then when we come back, we're going to be down at the border when you return. My name is Joaquin Castro and I proudly represent the great city of San Antonio, Texas in the United States Congress. And I have a delegation of several other members of Congress here with me today. Uh, and they'll all uh, have a chance to speak and introduce themselves and make their remarks. But we wanted to come here most of all to make sure that the kids that are in the care of this facility in Carrizo Springs, in the care of the United States government, are being respected and humanely treated and also to make sure that these children are placed with their family sponsors or relative sponsors as soon as possible. I know that over the last few weeks in particular, but over the last few months, there's been a lot of discussion and folks, some folks would say controversy over the conditions at the border. We need to be clear about something. President Biden inherited situation where the previous administration had sought to dismantle the infrastructure for processing asylum seekers and settling asylum seekers in the United States. It was an administration that was run in many ways on these issues by Stephen Miller. And during the pandemic, the Trump administration took advantage of that fact and sought to expel every single person who was coming to the United States to seek asylum, which people are allowed to do around the world, not just presenting at the United States border, but at any border around the world, consistent with international law. So the Biden administration has tried to respect international law and United States law. As you all know, there are still many folks under Title 42 that are being summarily expelled. Unaccompanied minors like the ones we saw today are not. They are being processed and their asylum claims are being considered. I think all of us would agree that the pictures that we've seen at the, the CBP facilities, as they've often been now and in the past, are horrendous and that nobody should be kept in those conditions. Those are awful conditions. That even these facilities that have better conditions than the CBP processing centers are not the places for kids that kids should be moved quickly along to their family sponsors. So we were here today to check on the status of the children. We had a chance to have conversations with them. Uh, there are folks that were from Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador, many of the places in Central America. They told us a little bit about their journeys and about their lives. Most of them have family members here that they're trying to get to while they have their asylum claims processed. We also had very good discussions with the leadership of this facility, BCFS out of San Antonio, about practical recommendations for the Biden administration to speed up the process by which asylum claims are considered so that people don't have to wait either in these facilities, but most certainly in the CBP facilities that we've seen pictures of again recently. And so we're here today to find solutions. We're here today to go back to Washington and offer recommendations for how this process can be improved, how the asylum process can be improved, and people's human rights can be respected. And so we came away today 
uh, with the feeling that we have something to share with the administration. The administration also visited here a few weeks ago. There have been other delegations, both Republican and Democrat, that have come through here. But most of all, our focus is on a solution to this issue. We're glad to see that the administration, the Biden administration, is building up the capacity to handle kids, the kids who have presented themselves for asylum. You all have probably heard that there's going to be at least one facility, if not two facilities in San Antonio, also a facility at the Dallas Convention Center, and another one in California, in San Diego, perhaps in other places. But again, the ultimate goal is to get kids into the safest place, which is with family sponsors, so that they can have their asylum claims processed. And so I'm going to turn it over now to Representative Ilhan Omar, who was once a refugee herself to this country. And each of the members of Congress will introduce themselves and make their remarks, and then we'll be glad to take some questions. Representative Omar. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ilhan Omar. I represent Minnesota's 5th Congressional District. Um, and I just want to uh, start out by thanking uh, Congressman Joaquin uh, Castro for um, inviting us today um, and for his leadership uh, on this issue and um, to my colleagues uh, in, in Congress who have been partners for good. Um, I think being here and listening um, to, to these kids, uh, hearing their stories, um, their hopes and aspirations um, is a reminder that this isn't about politics uh, and it isn't about playing games. It's about the humanity uh, of these children. It's about respecting uh, their, their dignity and it's about empathizing um, on uh, what, what it means to be in their situation. And for me, it took me back uh, to being uh, a young kid, just like themselves. We met uh, today 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds. I myself uh, was a, a child who fled, uh, like these kids, um, unconscionable violence, situations I think oftentimes we forget um, to, to consider here in, in our comforts in the United States that many uh, across the world are living with even our closest neighbors. And what I was also reminded um, is that oftentimes when we are having these conversations, you'll hear people say, you know, couldn't the president just tell them not to come? Couldn't, you know, we uh, have um, messaging and signals sent from an administration, from leaders that tell these families to, to be responsible and to not put their kids through the, 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 the horrendous um, journeys that they're putting their children through. And what I want to remind people is that when my father was making a decision for me at the age of eight to flee conflict, he was making a decision for me to live. That was the most reasonable and responsible thing a parent could have done. And so I know that for the parents that have made the decision to have their kids take on this journey are making a responsible decision because they want their kids to live, to have an opportunity. And what better place, right, um, to do that than the land of opportunity. And I know that people who are living in these conditions are not turning on the news to see who's president, right? What will they be met with when they come to the border? They are thinking about what it takes for them to survive. 
that's the decision they're making. Some of the kids we had conversations with today, when you ask them about, you know, what, what did you want us to, to tell the president? What conversations do you want us to share? They're like, I just want to be treated with dignity. I don't know who the president is, right? Because majority of the people are not, um, you know, political animals like we are. They're looking for an opportunity to survive and to thrive. And so I know that there's a lot of conversations we get to have about the politics and the logistics of all of this. But at the end of the day, at the center and the heart of this conversation are children. Children who are fleeing unconscionable situations who desperately need for us to meet them with dignity and humanity and to make sure that we are living up to international, what international law dictates and what our laws dictate in regards to allowing people to seek asylum in our country. So with that, I will hand it over to Congresswoman Barbara Lee. And just a heads up, we are going to go into a quick two-minute break. For really sharing the story, and the story as it relates to uh, to our, our two children. And this is what it's about, the future. It's about children. And thank you, Congressman Joaquin Castro, for pulling us together to bring us here. Because the decisions we make uh, will be informed by what we saw today, what we learned today, and I want to thank you for really uh, bringing it home for us. I am Barbara Lee. Uh, I represent uh, the 13th Congressional District of California, which includes Oakland and Berkeley, California. But I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas, in an immigrant community, which I am very proud of. I have to also say that I look and I approach um, these children in terms of their health and safety from the lens of a clinical social worker, which is my professional background, but also as a member of Congress. What we learned today, one, is so important in terms of just the children's health and mental health. I'm always interested in their mental health especially and looking at uh, crisis intervention and trauma-informed care, which these young people, as you know, need. And I was pleased, and I visited other facilities under the prior administration, and I was pleased to see and learn that these young people have that type of uh, crisis intervention, mental health services available to them. Secondly, uh, the young people who we talk to, they, um, even though they've had a very difficult time in their countries and coming here, they have a lot of hope. Uh, they want to see their families. They want to talk with their families. They want to be with their families and their sponsors. And so the time length that they spend here needs to be shortened, and we need to find ways to expedite the process so that they can be reunited with their sponsors and or their families. And I think that as a member of the Appropriations Committee, I serve on the Subcommittee on Health and Human Services and as well as chair of the state and foreign operations uh, subcommittee of the appropriations committee with congressman uh, pete aguilar and congresswoman jennifer wexton i think what we learned today will really inform the funding decisions that we make uh, as we move forward to make sure that the children's health and safety are a priority and to make sure that the time frame is expedited so that they can be reunited Finally, I will just say, as chair of the Subcommittee on State and Foreign Operations, we are working with the Biden-Harris administration to really address the root causes, which uh, Congresswoman Omar and Congressman uh, Castro laid out. And so I'm very uh, proud of my members on that subcommittee who really want to get to the root causes and to work with the Biden-Harris administration, of course, with our vice president now leading the effort to address the poverty and economic development and violence and all of the issues that underlie what we know takes place and uh, why these children are here. So thank you all again. Thank you so much, Congressman Castro, and thank all the members for really, really, this is, this is a mission of, I believe, what, what we have to do, not only as members of Congress, but as human beings, as parents, and as grandparents. And so it's, it's really an honor to be here.
Thank you, Chairwoman Lee. Uh, my name is Pete Aguilar. I'm the vice chair of the House Democratic Caucus. I want to thank uh, Chairman Castro, uh, my chairman from the Hispanic Caucus uh, days, and, and his entire team for helping to organize this trip. Uh, and you're joined by a broad cross-section uh, in every way uh, from the House Democratic Caucus uh, on this trip. And we all come from our own perspectives, but we are focused on one of the essential functions uh, that is our job of providing oversight. And we take that job very seriously. Uh, Congresswoman Wexton and Chairwoman Lee and I serve on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, I serve on the Homeland Security Subcommittee. And like Chairwoman Lee mentioned, these, uh, what we saw uh, and the conversations that we had will help inform the decisions that we are going to make uh, to ensure that this uh, system uh, becomes better. We all agree that it is a broken immigration system that was compounded by decisions that the prior administration made from withholding aid to the Northern Triangle countries to dismantling our asylum process. Uh, we know that we can do better and we're pleased to have partners in the Biden-Harris administration who want to help us do that job. Uh, so uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come see with my own eyes uh, what, is, what is happening here, uh, the conditions, uh, to have conversations with these young people, um, to understand uh, their, their perspective and to see that they have relatives who are willing to sponsor them uh, in the United States. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here and I will now introduce uh, Congressman Jimmy Panetta from California. Thank you, thank you, Pete. Thank you, uh, Congressman Castro, uh, for the second time that you've hosted me uh, to the border. I appreciate that. Thank you to all of my colleagues and thanks to all of you for being here uh, to cover this. Uh, my name is Jimmy Panetta. I represent the Central Coast of California and California's 20th Congressional District. Clearly not a border district, but I can tell you a lot of my constituents have crossed the border. A lot of their families have crossed the border. And so it's my responsibility to be here to make sure that those who cross the border to avail themselves of the laws of this country are treated with the same respect, the same dignity, and the same purpose that are the foundation of the laws of our nation. And what we've seen today and what we've heard today is that it comes down to resources. And unlike the last administration that was unwilling to provide the resources, I do believe that this administration, you are seeing resources being and will continue to be provided in order to deal with the number of people who are coming here, in order to deal with the unaccompanied minors who are here, who, as I just heard personally, are seeking a better life as their parents wanted for them as well. And ultimately, as I have come to, when I, as I grew up with my Italian immigrant grandparents, that is the American dream. And it's our responsibility here to make sure these young men and women who are coming here have that opportunity to fulfill the American dream. And that's my message back to this administration, is that to continue to work together so that we can fund the resources necessary so that we can continue to work with these men and women who are coming here. And so I look forward to doing that, be it on the Ways and Means Committee, I'm on the Armed Services Committee, I'm on the Ag Committee. All three of those committees, I believe this issue affects us. And so I look forward to working on that, working with all of my colleagues as we go forward to make sure that everybody has the same opportunities that we did. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Oh, I think we're Sorry. It's okay. Jennifer Wexton. Well, hello and good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Wexton. I, re I represent Virginia's 10th congressional district. So, so Virginia, not a not a border not a border community, but I did have an opportunity in my previous life as a as a guardian ad litem to work with some of the unaccompanied minors who were in foster care. And so, I, when I heard what was going on here at the border, I wanted to come and see for myself and ensure that these kids were being treated. In a, in a way that was safe and in secure and with the dignity that they deserve. And from what I saw here today, I'm very confident that they are. But I also came to see for myself what we can do better and to lear listen and to learn. And we came away with, with, uh, with concrete examples of things that we can do to help speed the process 
so that kids don't have to spend so long in facilities like this. Things that we should do at the border to help speed their process there as well. And, and we're also going to have to address the long-term factors as well. Because this is not something that arose overnight and we're not going to fix it overnight. So we need to get serious about also dealing with the push factors in the Northern Triangle countries. And I'm very pleased to have partners in the Biden-Harris administration to make that a reality. So thank you very much. It was great to join you here today. And now I'll toss it to Rashida Tlaib. Thank you so much uh, to Joaquin again uh, for allowing me as a member of the House Oversight Committee to come myself uh, and be the eyes and ears for many of our American neighbors all across the country who cannot access these facilities and be able to look in the eyes and listen directly from the people being directly impacted uh, by us not doing more to have a just, humane immigration system. You know, today a young boy from Guatemala just looked at me and I said, well, what is it that you want me to know? What do you, what do you want the president to know? And uh, he said that I'm a human being. And it was that simple for him. And, and, and I, I, you know, looked at him and for, for me, I want to do right by somebody that just is seeking uh, that kind of human dignity to be just acknowledged as a fellow being. And one of the really important things that we learned here today is these are frontline organizations on the ground here, federal agencies on the ground here who are telling us, this is what you can do. This is what you can do to make sure that children can live, right? And today, as I got off this bus, all I could think of was Jacqueline. Jacqueline, who was only seven years old when she died in detention in 2018, under our care. I don't want that to happen to any child under our care. So it is our responsibility and our duty to come here, to be the eyes and ears for the, our country, and to make sure that we do right. What I can tell you is I'm optimistic that if the Biden administration has already sent folks here to listen to recommendations of how we can be able to make sure that these children are not already going through more trauma when they get here. You can hear that and see it in their faces. I'm a mother. I saw it in their faces. They're tired, but they're so still scared. And it's so important for us to be able to again understand that these are children. These are children. And just a heads up, some of you are going into a quick two minute break. Make sure that again the resources are here, but also the policies are in place to make sure that again that we are treating them humanely. And there are processes now that are legal. And again, we need to make sure that we're following those processes and not allowing people to use these folks as some sort of political pundit. They're not. These are children. And it's again very important that we are here to investigate, to fully see it, to have that oversight, and again, do right by these folks. And again, you know, I don't want to hear about another seven year old or anyone under our care to have gotten that sick and died. And again, what I saw here today, again, was I was hopeful that we are leading with compassion, finally. So thank you all so much. All right, well, that concludes our remarks from the members of Congress. Uh, we have time for about three questions. Uh, we've got to get back to San Antonio. Some of the folks are going to go on to El Paso, where Veronica Escobar, the congresswoman from El Paso, is having people to inspect uh, the border patrol stations there. Antonio. Okay. Would you say these kids are better off here than being just let go on drones? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, and others have as well, uh, the ultimate destination and the right destination for these kids is with their family or relative sponsors. It does take some time to process them, and they're much better off here than they are in the CPP, CBP processing centers where uh, we have seen, not just in the last week or so, but even before, in years past, the conditions at the CBP processing centers uh, where you have people sleeping with aluminum, what it looks like aluminum blankets and so forth. Uh, so this is a much better situation for them, but it's not the right situation for them. They had a group of children for us to speak to, but we also interacted with others who were there spontaneously as well. These kids volunteered. Uh, and those kids volunteered. Yeah, let me just finish this one. Um, and with respect to COVID-19, they're taking all COVID-19 protocols. 
we were all made to wear N95 masks. We've all been vaccinated. Uh, so they're taking very, very careful care with the kids who are affected with COVID-19. Yeah, what's really all right. different, I'm sorry. What's Please. Really, what's so incredibly different from what I saw in the El Paso border with Joaquin was the lack of medical care. Here, I, it was extraordinary to see the number of medical staff here on site uh, to address not only obviously the physical, but also the trauma, but they are, you know, had us come and see how the quarantine process is and so forth. And again, many of them uh, were already scared. They're 13, 40, very young kids. Uh, but you can see they very much have competent staff here, uh, medical staff that are, uh, I just saw them doing exams today, uh, saw them again interacting with the kids uh, continually. And, and again, and how they're also doing it is, is uh, even among uh, the groups is making sure they're not with folks that are not positive. So we saw that firsthand uh, exactly the process that they go through. And, it, and again, it was uh, for me, uh, you know, I think as a mom, I was like, this is good. <laughs> this is this is making sure that other kids are not impacted. But yeah. Yep. The recommendations for speeding up the process. Yeah. Well, look, we want to find solutions for this situation. And we want to figure out how this system can work better so that it's more humane, more respectful of people's dignity and ultimately achieves its goal, which is to give people their day in court to be considered for asylum. Not everybody who petitions for asylum is going to be allowed to stay in the United States. That's a fact. But these folks should have their day in court. That's what they're asking for. Uh, and we should treat them humanely in the meantime. Uh, and so with respect to some of the recommendations, um, for example, there was a recommendation on how the federal government could, could keep people in places other than the CBP processing centers so that they would still be identified for who they are when they come into the, when they present themselves at the border, uh, but they wouldn't be kept in those cramped facilities and that you could process them more quickly by mobilizing the federal agencies to one location uh, to do that because we're talking about thousands of people uh, right now. Um, yeah, there were also recommendations about uh, you know, the, the, the work hours for folks who are working on these kinds of cases. Uh, in the past, people's work time was not utilized um, in the way that perhaps the best way that it could have been. And so we got a list of specific recommendations. Uh, those were also passed along, many of them to the administration a few weeks ago. Uh, but I'm glad that we were also informed of them so that we can go back uh, and press the administration on work on those things as well. Yes, Barbara. One of the most important recommendations that uh, has been presented is a variety of ways to shorten the length of time, when, when shorten the length of time that the young people will be here so that they can, uh, this is a transition point, so that they can be reunited with their family responses. So they've recommended how to do that uh, in a very efficient manner. And, and once again, it, it gets down to more resources. Like I said, we were talking about, well, how do you verify the family members that are that are not here and in other parts of the country? And it's sending caseworkers out there. It's doing background checks. And so that takes, once again, it takes a lot of resources to do that. You don't think that through, but that's all the steps it needs in order for these young men and women to be processed accordingly. No, I mean, look, um, we come to these facilities to figure out what's going on and figure out how we can make things better. And that requires not just our efforts, but other members of Congress and the administration and local officials and nonprofits. And so it's a, you know, it's a big process to do that. Um, and, and it takes a lot of work, not just from the members of Congress, but also from our staff who are here as well. And so we're here in earnest. I, I can't speak to I know Senators Cornyn and Cruz, I think, are in the Rio Grande Valley today. Uh, I don't know whether they've done their event or not. Um, I don't know what their purpose is. I, oh, yeah. I mean, I've, 
in fact, I think on Twitter, I, I, before we did this trip, I said any member of Congress who's interested in attending um, to reach out to my office. I've done that before on the other trips that I've done. And we've actually had on occasion in the past, not this time, but we've actually had uh, Republican members of Congress that, that have been part of things that I've, Codell's that I've been on to border facilities. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. any Go ahead. Young people fleeing violence is a crisis. Um, a broken immigration system is a crisis. Uh, we can call it whatever we want. Our job is to help fix it. And so that's what we are focused on. That is, that is our job, that is our responsibility. Um, and so while, uh, and I know Kevin McCarthy and House Republicans came down to the border previously and they had zero solutions. When asked, what would you change? They had, they had no comments. They wanted to play politics. They want to go to the, the most difficult, you know, CBP facilities and point to it and say that the president created this. And what we are focused on is from the minute individuals claim lawful legal asylum to the minute that they are paired back with a relative, that that is a humane process that goes from CBP to ORR to facilities like the one behind us and that it is done in a safe and humane way. And so while Republicans want to talk about Mr. Potato Head and Dr. Seuss, you know, we are focused on delivering solutions for our communities. What are some of your recommendations to the well, we just shared some of those, and then we'll share some of those when we get back to, to Washington. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, no, I, one of the immediate things they said was OR was dismantled in the previous administration, and, and they didn't put a request for proposal out to basically be able to continue to have opportunities for a humanitarian process for children. So it was very clear from folks here, they told us, there was nothing because the previous administration cut completely cut the program or any humanitarian process. And then they said, you know, they 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 understood, you know, what political uh, maneuver that was. But we understand that hurt kids, that hurt our country, and not being able to again have this uh, process in place as humane and just. And so it was very clear if you look at look at the data the information. But OR was pretty much dismantled. They they didn't send any requests for proposals out to continue that program and at the result this is why i think it's we're so I, oh no it's it yeah it's already been happening let, let me say this i think it's been made very clear by the administration that it's not more resources they're looking for um that it is not the executive orders that they did that has cost uh, you know what's what's happening with with our our borders and and the children that are coming in. Um, these are these are natural occurring, right? And so what they're looking for right now is to figure out how the resources they already have. The administration hasn't asked for new resources. The resources they already have, how to deploy that in the most effective way to address a problem that was created by an administration that believed you had to. Uh, uh, create maximum pain in order for immigrants not to come to our border. And so when you have an administration now that says we are going to deploy maximum humanity and dignity in treating people in regards to our policies, then we are excited because then we see partners in humanity. We see partners who see children who are coming to our country seeking help. And what we are ready for, right, is to listen to the recommendations that are made that the administration already sent representatives for. And as members of Congress, use, right, our collaborative work and say, these are the recommendations that you got when you were there. We heard the same things. What is it going to take for you to be able to implement these recommendations? What is it going to take for you to expedite these reunification for some of these kids who are here who already have family members here? What is it going to take for you to have more licensed um, places so that kids who don't have immediate family members here can be in, in those environments? How do we expedite the asylum process 
for some of these kids. We also recognize, unlike Republicans, that there is a crisis happening with our neighboring countries. That is why you see the vice president be, be part of a, a head of a task force that is going to address that. Because we can't address uh, migration without addressing the root causes of migration. And many of, that have, many of us have been talking about that for a really long time, right? People don't just choose to leave the, the comfort of their home and their country unless they have to. And we have a lot of resources here in this country to, to be both partners to our neighboring countries and provide resources in order for there to be uh, mitigation um, in, in the migration that we are seeing. But it's, it's going to take time. It's a lot of work. We're all committed to it. Uh, and it's really important that when you all are asking these questions, that it's not about just the games that are being played or the politics, but it's about the real humans and the real situations people are in so that we can actually have conversations about what to do and how to move forward. Thank you all. All right, y'all. Take care. All right, so once again, Democratic representatives, uh, they're giving us a uh, comments about what they did see at uh, the facility that they were touring. Don't forget, we do still have some uh, representatives on the Republican side, senators, 18 of them that are also uh, down in Texas uh, touring the facility. Uh, going out to uh, what's just been tweeted with our governor, Doug Ducey, uh, he did say that the Arizona National Guard has been deployed at the border. Here's some video of uh, one of our senators from Oklahoma. He had tweeted out this video of a pod that's supposed to hold 80, and it currently is holding more than 700 people. So uh, back here to uh, Doug Ducey, he did say, uh, that he's requested a federal reimbursement for the deployment of the National Guard uh, to be uh, deployed down to the border to help assist police in that area. And uh, we're going to continue to follow uh, these uh, developing border crisis stories for you here on News Nail from Fox. So what we're going to do is uh, take some of you into another quick two-minute break. And when we return, we'll have more your way, including a suspect who stole a police cruiser and led police on a chase. We'll have an update on that coming up here here shortly on News Now from Fox. And welcome back here to News Now from Fox. We are taking a live look at the big board as we 
are in the green, up nearly 200 points here on this Friday. I like to see green as we uh, wrap up this week. Uh, well, I'd want to turn to a story that, uh, yes, uh, I'm saying is uh, true. There was a suspect, an armed robbery suspect, who stole a police cruiser, led police on a chase, and authorities uh, out in the Boston area did give an update after, again, it was a, not only one chase, but a second chase after he had stopped and refused to get out of the car. Uh, let's go out and get that update for you guys right here on News Now from Fox. Um, my name is Michael Morrissey. I'm the Norfolk District Attorney. And so I'm going to start out by saying uh, this is very early on and it's probably incomplete, but we're going to give you the, some of the information that we have at this time. Um, the, other, the other person I think that may have a word to say, um, I do have with me um, a, a number of people who have been active all morning, including the Deputy Superintendent, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Scott Wormington, and he will probably be the spokesperson for the state police. The Colonel actually has been burning the phone wires up and I've been in touch with us all morning. Uh, I have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jack Morn fr from DIS who's here, Lieutenant Colonel uh, James Hanlon from Field Services, and Major David Gallagher of the state police. I also have uh, my own local police department chief, Paul Keenan here, and uh, his administrative staff, uh, Captain Dugan and Captain Steele are with us also. Um, and then last but not least, uh, uh, Detective Lieutenant Jerry Metaliano, who works directly with us in the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office. So what I can tell you is... Um, uh, the, Mayor, can, we, can you just uh, place the cameras a little bit more square yourself? The, 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 the sure. Uh, so that, on yeah, well, I was trying to give you my best side. I so know, you are. I thought okay. so. All right, so um, I, I would tell you that at approximately 7 o'clock, a 36-year-old white male entered a rock on 7-Eleven armed with a reported handgun with an, with an intent to rob the, the uh, premises and he made off with an undetermined amount of cash. Uh, Rockland police were notified. They immediately be began a search and a chase, both on foot and in an auto to try to apprehend the suspect. The suspect was able to, uh, to enter a Rockland police cruiser and he fled the scene to his Weymouth and Abington and made his way onto Route 18. Now, during that chase, the suspect struck a number of police cruisers of local departments. Shortly after 7 o'clock, the state police were notified and identified a vehicle on Route 3 North. They joined the pursuit. The suspect in the Rockland police vehicle entered the Bergen Parkway exit at the ramp at 7.22 a.m. and came to a stop on the ramp near the train station entering Quincy. The state police arrived. Uh, including the state police beer cat, which fortuitously happened to be in the area at the time. The local police and other departments that had joined were also there at the ramp, and, and the beer cat was able to come up next to the vehicle and try to engage the individual uh, in an attempt to, um, to stop the chase and to apprehend him and check, to check on the suspect's well-being. After one hour, it appears that the suspect was able to start the vehicle and he headed down Bergen Parkway. The police had employed stop sticks on Bergen Parkway and brought help bring the car to a slow stop right near BJ's gas station, which a number of you have seen. The, uh, the beer cat was used to bring the car to a stop. And when, when that was, and you saw the evidence of the collision with the beer cat, the Quincy police beer cat then came upon the scene and they pinned the vehicle in at that time. The suspect was still in the car. Now negotiations continued again, this time with a, uh, the trained state police negotiation team who had also arrived on the scene at that time. The local police assets, including the state police stop team, were deployed during this negotiation process. During the verbal negotiations, the police observed the suspect in control of a police patrol rifle. Despite the numerous requests to surrender, the suspect started to come out of the passenger door armed with the patrol rifle. The state police stop team member discharged his weapon and shot the suspect. The state police stop team medics were also on scene at that time and they rendered immediate medical assistance to the suspect as well as amb ambulance services were provided by Brewster Ambulance, the carrier here in the city. They were also on scene and the suspect was transported immediately to the Boston Medical Center where he was pronounced dead at 10.15 a.m. 
Um, we'd take some brief comments, but we still have a lot of work to do, so we may not be able to answer all your questions. Yeah, so this suspect, well, can you name the suspect? Are you naming we, him yet? We, uh, we have not had the opportunity to notify the family. We know who he is, and uh, right now I'm just prepared to tell you he's 36 year old and he's a white male. Did he point that weapon at state police when he got on that, I, on I, that cruiser? I, I'm, not, I'm not going to, uh, to get into that, that, that uh, at this time. There's still gathering statements and doing work. That's what uh, what I know, and that's what I have been told, and they're going to continue to gather more information. Do you see anything here that says that the whoever uh, was involved in this police-involved shooting did not act the way that he or she is trained? Uh, it's, let me start again. It is, it is unfortunate that anybody gets shot by anyone, and, and uh, the last thing that I think a police officer wants to do is to be involved in a police-related shooting. And so, you know, their job is to keep all of us safe and those people, I think they tried to clear people out of the area. They're faced with an armed suspect. They have decisions to make and those decisions will be reviewed over the next few days. That's all I can tell you. How did you talk about how was he able to leave the, how was he able to leave the first stop scene of the off-ramp for the Bergen Parkway when they were negotiating with him there? Can you take us through? Well, I, again, uh, I, I will tell you just a little bit of it because we're still putting it together. You know, it appears the vehicle uh, may may have um, come to a stop. I don't know whether it's mechanical or not, but they had tried to convince him numerous times, and they had the beer cat at that time to to go up just to make sure they you know they were concerned of obviously being shot themselves. So they were able to use the beer cat, and and uh, after an hour, he was able to obviously get the vehicle started again. And they were prepared for that. It appears they used the stop sticks on Bergen Parkway, and they had again additional assets in place, and they were able to bring him to a stop right by the BJ's gas station on Bergen Parkway. How did he manage to get a hold of a marked police cruiser? I, I, all I can tell you at this time um, is that, that uh, they had a, a pretty active both foot and, and uh, vehicle pursuit in Rockland and we're putting those pieces together now. Did he break into the cruiser or was the cruiser left unlocked? I, I can't answer that. How about it? how are you negotiating with him? Uh, over the police scanner? The, uh, the no, no, I, I, I let the... Uh, 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 the deputy superintendent speak a little, but I'm, I'm told, you know, two, you have two different sites, over an hour, two different sites, so they have the professional team in the second one, but I may ask the, the, uh, the deputy superintendent to talk about the negotiation. I'm sorry, could you ask a question again? I was again? curious, how were you negotiating with him through the, the communications in the cruiser, how were they, you were able to... The big cat, as you, if you saw the scene, they were, they were, one was right in front of it, the one was right behind it, we were in close proximity, they were able to speak to the uh, suspect, right, uh, verbally. What were you the saying? saying? Yeah. Oh, we can't get into that. Can you just give us a sense of how you're trying to disarm him and try to get him to comply and give up? Can you give us a sense of how that conversation went? We, we can't comment on that at this Why time. Why wasn't the police rifle locked? I'm sorry? Why wasn't the police rifle locked? Again, um, I, I can't, we can't answer a lot of these questions. I, I don't... Um, we don't have all the answers this time. I mean, that will probably be asked during the during the uh, ongoing investigation. What I can tell you is that the police did become aware that he had gained possession of a patrol rifle. That was quite evident to them during the negotiations. And when he attempted to exit the vehicle, he had the uh, the weapon in hand. At any time, was he threatening to take his own life? Uh, again, uh, I'm not going to get into the ongoing discussions with the negotiators. Yeah, can we talk a little bit about what started this whole thing down in Rockland? Uh, it was uh, an armed robbery, is that right? Well, it's purported armed robbery. And, and, um, and then uh, according to what information I have, there's an undetermined amount of cash taken. So that will also be part of the investigation, but I believe that set off the chain of events. That started it, so he ran out of the convenience store? Both ran on, on foot, and then uh, the, I understand that Rockland used both you know, foot chase and vehicles to try to contain the suspect and he was able to get a vehicle. That's really all I have to say at this time on, on that part of it. Abington, when he ran a police officer is injured. Cruises, is that because they, were those cruisers surrounding him trying to get him to stop and he was ramming Well, I, I, on the chase, I'm told, and I don't have the total number, but I know that um, various local departments were involved in the chase from Rockland up into Route 18. So you had Abington and Weymouth police at a minimum, as well as the Rockland police. And I'm told that he struck both Abington and, and uh, Weymouth vehicles. I can't give you the number at this time to gather that information. All right, guys. Once again, uh, that was the latest uh, update from police there. And I did want to bring it to everyone here on News Now from Fox because we had went to that breaking news scene earlier uh, when police were in that standoff with the suspect. So I always love to uh, continue to update people on the latest with these developing stories that we follow. We're going to head into another quick two-minute break. More to come your way after that.
And welcome back. Live look once again at the Dow as we continue to see green here across the board. And since we're uh, in New York, I do want to continue to update everyone on the latest with uh, many of those uh, scandals and uh, things that have been coming out about New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. Now, uh, people are saying and there's uh, been accusations that he is setting had set up uh, tests for his own family members when it came to COVID-19. Let's go get the latest right here for you on News Now from Fox. The fact that the president of the pharmaceutical company Regeneron, George Yankopoulos, knows Governor Andrew Cuomo paid dividends. The New York Times reports today that Yankopoulos and his family got state-administered coronavirus tests at home last March. Yankopoulos is the latest VIP known to have gotten the preferential testing treatment. His case is unique because Regeneron has business interests in New York State. Shortly after Yankopoulos and his family got tested, Cuomo made this announcement. Regeneron, which is a great New York company, uh, has created 500,000 testing kits at no charge. Thank you, Regeneron. The company told the Times that Yankopoulos was not involved in donating the kits. The news follows accounts in the Albany Times Union and Washington Post that some of Cuomo's family members, including his brother Chris, a CNN anchor, and his mother Matilda, also got state-administered COVID tests. Assemblyman Charles Levine says the special access will become part of the Assembly's investigation, which is also looking into sexual misconduct allegations against the governor and his handling of nursing homes. It's Mayor Bill de Blasio was asked about the preferential testing but... treatment. Uh, as much as it raises real concerns, um, this pales in comparison to the nursing home scandal. A scandal born of a directive the state issued one year ago yesterday ordering nursing homes to accept COVID positive patients. Loved ones of some of those who died gathered in Foley Square yesterday. Among them, Vivian Zayas, whose mother, Anna Martinez, contracted the virus at a nursing home on Long Island. She and others called on Comptroller Tom DiNapoli to begin a state probe into the governor's handling of the facilities. I had a Matilda. I had a Matilda that I would protect, that I watched over, that I was an advocate for. And he protected his Matilda and sacrificed mine. Hesitancy. It's distrust. It's the black community and the Hispanic community has less trust in the system. So when the Trump administration stood up and said, don't worry, this vaccine is safe, they said, I don't believe you. By the way, I didn't believe the Trump administration when they stood up and said it was safe. But I understand the skepticism, I understand the cynicism, but the facts tell the opposite story. We didn't trust the Trump administration to say it was safe. We had the best New York doctors and healthcare professionals in the state review the vaccine. They said it is safe. Seven million people have taken the vaccine. Seven million people. My mother took the vaccine. I took the vaccine, seven million people. It is safe. And if you wanna talk about risk, the risk is not in taking the vaccine. The risk is in not taking the vaccine. That's where the risk is. How, if you get sick, and what happens if you get sick? If you get sick and who you infect, that's the risk. That's why everyone has to take this vaccine and that's why we're here to assure people who have this trust i don't know if i should believe every major black medical professional major hispanic medical professionals elected leaders pastors who are here today everyone saying the same thing this is a safe vaccine you should take it the second thing we have to do after the vaccine is we have to rebuild.
Spring says resurrection. Spring says life comes back. But it does not come back automatically. God helps those who help themselves. God doesn't say, you sit there and I will pick you up and raise you up. God says, I will be with you, but you need to do what you need to do. And you have to show the resilience and, and take the effort to stand up. And just a heads up, some of you are going to go into a quick two-minute break as we continue to listen in to Governor Cuomo out in New York. Confident in New Yorkers and confident in our ability to do that because that's who we are. This is one of those life moments that tests and shows character. You know when you know who a person is? Not in the good days. You know who a person is when they get knocked to the ground, when life hits them and, and sets them back, when they have a health emergency, when they have a problem in their family, when they lose their job, when they have a setback. Life will knock you on your rear end for one reason or another. But in that moment, now we're going to see who you are. Now we're going to see what you're made of. What do you do when life knocks you on your rear end? Do you sit there and say, oh, woe is me. How unfair. Or do you say, I'm getting up. I'm getting up and I'm going to be smarter for what happened. And I'm going to be grabbing the arms of my friends and we're going to pull ourselves up together. New York says, we're going to get up and we're going to get up better and stronger than ever before. That's who New York is. That's what we did after 9-11. I remember like it was yesterday. Terrible loss of life, fear, trauma. And many of the naysayers said, oh, New York will never be the same. We'll never be the same. We're a terrorist target, and New York will never be the same. Some naysayers said that, but the majority said, no. We're going to build back, and we're going to be better and stronger than ever before. Yes, we're changed. Yes, we're more security-focused, more security-conscious after 9-11, but we're building back better than ever before, and we did. It happened after Hurricane Sandy. Oh my gosh, how can we rebuild? How can we do this? We did. And you know where else we saw it? We saw it in Puerto Rico with Hurricane Maria. 2017, Hurricane Maria. Not only did New Yorkers say that we're going to rebuild New York, when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. What New Yorkers said is, we're going to take our spirit of resilience, our spirit of, of charity, our character, and we're going to go to Puerto Rico in their moment of need, and we're going to help them rebuild. The first plane that lands in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, New Yorkers. Ruben Diaz, Marcos Crespo, Nidia Velasquez, Andrew Cuomo, on the first plane that landed in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. <laughs> after Hurricane Maria, when Puerto Rico was just struggling, an earthquake, an earthquake. And again, the question is, what does Puerto Rico do? And what do New Yorkers do? And we were on the next plane again, helping Puerto Rico. Rosanna Rosado, 1,000 pallets of supplies, millions of dollars in aid, 1,000 SUNY students and CUNY students went down to Puerto Rico to visit. I went down on a trip with my daughter Michaela, who's here today. We were on the back of a large army truck driving through a neighborhood 
it was so high that the telephone lines, the power lines, were just going across the top of the truck. We were with the governor of Puerto Rico, and he was at one end of the truck with my daughter, Michaela. I was at the other end of the truck. I turn around, and a power line is coming over the truck right for Michaela's head. The governor grabbed her head like a basketball <laughs> and luckily bent her head down and the, and the cable went right over. But we were there. We were there because that's who we are. And it's going to be the same spirit that we're going to bring to New York. We're not just going to build back after COVID. We're not just going to automatically evolve after COVID. We're going to create a New York that was better than ever before because we learned from COVID. We learned from the pandemic. We learned the strength of unity. We learned how to organize. We learned how to come together. We learned that we were mutually interconnected, that I wear this mask because I love you and because you wear this mask because you love me. And that transcended all race, color, creed, the unity of community. And that's the key to rebuilding. We also opened today the Hurricane Maria Memorial, which we said that we would build after, <laughs> we said we would build a memorial after Hurricane Maria to, to remember the victims of Hurricane Maria but also to remember the experience and the solidarity with the people of Puerto Rico. Uh, and also as a memorial for the connection between the people of New York and the people of Puerto Rico. That Hurricane Maria Memorial is located at Battery Park City. From that memorial, you see the Statue of Liberty. It is the New York Harbor. And it's our way of once again memorializing all of our Puerto Rican brothers and sisters who came to New York and joined the New York family. I want to thank the commission and the memorial that worked so hard on it. Rosanna Rosado, who is our Secretary of State, who's done an extraordinary job. I want to thank... Marcos Crespo, Tony Burgos, Edwin Melendez, Dennis Rivera, Casimir. All right, guys, as he continues to uh, in, be in that uh, press conference and uh, talking about how they're going to be building back New York, uh, I do want to move things along. Now, just a reminder, we are still waiting for our uh, shot to come up here to our desk, but uh, we do have 18 U.S. senators all the way from Alaska down to Texas, all the way from Oklahoma, South Carolina, over to uh, Montana. There's 18 GOP senators who are doing a border facility tour at this time, and then they are supposed to be uh, speaking with the media now that's supposed to be happening here uh, it's scheduled for in five minutes but uh, sometimes you know those tours do end up taking a little bit longer but no matter what we are going to have it right here for you on news now from fox uh, so until that time let's jump back out to that white house press conference because the border uh, continues to be a question brought up in these white house uh, press briefings and so here is once again our uh, white house press secretary jen saki <laughs> In many schools all across the country, they are not going back to the classrooms and there aren't imminent plans to do so because teachers unions say that they want their teachers to be vaccinated first, even though the CDC says that's not required. How are you going to deal with that? And are there any discussions about saying to teachers unions, you have to go back to the classrooms? Well, first, actually, 76% of schools are do have teaching, uh, do have kids in the classroom for part of the week and about 46% uh, are back five days a week, and we expect that to continue to increase over time. Uh, the president said the majority. He wants the majority right, to be but by day 100, and yes. we're on track to meet that objective. Uh, I will say that we took a step uh, in this administration to prioritize teachers uh, through our pharmacy program. We, that program is working. It's effective. Teachers can go. They are prioritized at pharmacies. It's something we had the power to take and implement, even without, even, and we feel it's very much in line with the CDC guidelines. 
guidelines because it is one of the mitigation steps and it's a step we had the power to take and put into place. We actually don't see an issue uh, coming up with um, with uh, schools not reopening. They are reopening, more are reopening every single week, and uh, we certainly feel we're on track to meet our goal. And when you look at some of the polling as it relates to the vaccinations, mm -hmm. still about 30% of adults say they don't plan to get one. How do you get things back to normal with those types of figures, and when specifically do you plan to move forward with the vaccine campaign to try to improve education? It's launching, Kristen. It's happening. Uh, we, we are launching a public campaign. There are some details that have been out um, and reported, um, uh, I believe, in the Wall Street Journal. We'll get all that information out to all of you. Uh, I will say that uh, what we have um, learned from our own data is that part of our investment and focus needs to be in trusted voices and trusted partners. We've seen some uh, improvement in confidence uh, uh, among a range of communities in the efficacy of the, of the vaccine. That, that's good news, right? Uh, but we have seen concern about, and what we still have concern about, is uh, access. And that is the big issue. Because now when we start to um, uh, get to uh, get to the point where we are trying to reach uh, rain more and more and more communities, of course, vaccinate adults, uh, Americans in this country, a lot of people can't take a day off to go get a vaccine. They don't have a fle the flexibility to be in the slot available. They maybe can't drive three miles to their local pharmacy. So our big investment right now is in access. That means increasing investments in mobile units, in community health centers, in mass vaccination sites. Uh, but it also means, in terms of the public campaign, investing in trusted voices uh, and empowering local groups and organizations uh, to have the funding, the information, and the assistance they need. Just to follow up with my question with the president yesterday, I asked him about transparency and access for journalists into some of the facilities at the border. The president said, I will commit when my plan is underway to have access. It sounded to a lot of people like he was saying, I will let more cameras in once I'm satisfied with the conditions. How is that consistent with trends? That's not actually what he meant. I'll first say we did allow access, including an NBC camera exclusively into the shelter facility on Wednesday. And we're committed to increasing access and doing additional pools uh, making it available, these facilities, including the Border Patrol facilities, as well as the shelters. What he was conveying is right now his focus is on moving these kids uh, out of these Border Patrol facilities, right, and making sure it's done in a, a way that keeps them safe and keeps everyone safe. That does not imply that we are not going to allow access until that is done. It implies that is his first focus. So um, I, thanks for asking the question. That was his, in, in, that was his intention. Time frame for when, and noted that NBC did go in as pool. Do you have a time frame for when the next round of cameras might be allowed in? Oh, we're, we're working on it, hopefully soon. Uh, and it's something we're certainly committed to, and we're just working with DHS and HHS on when we can make it possible. Uh, oh, go ahead in the back. So obviously they're on guns. Obviously there's lots of pieces of legislation yeah. the president is advocating for. But when he spoke yesterday about priorities, some gun control groups felt frustrated. They felt like he was saying gun control is not a priority compared to infrastructure, compared to build back better. What's your response to, to groups who took that message away from the president's comments yesterday? Well, first, the president understands their frustration. And he understands it as one of the few people in government who ever beat the NRA twice by leading the fight to pass the Brady Bill and the assault weapons ban. He understands this as a person who led the effort at President Obama's request to strengthen gun measures after Sandy Hook, and when that was voted down, helped put in place 23 executive actions to combat gun violence. You'll see more executive action, as Josh and others were asking about, and that review's underway, and more efforts by him uh, and the administration to move forward in the weeks ahead, whether that is on legislation, supporting efforts that are happening in states, which we've seen is very effective and impactful, and largely due to the advocacy and activism of a lot of these uh, groups. Uh, but, you know, we would say that um, the frustration should be vented at the members of the House and Senate who voted against the measures the president supports. And we'd certainly support their advocacy in that regard. And on the border, uh 
All right, guys, we want to continue to move things along because uh, we do have uh, deadly storms that had made their way through the south as uh, cleanup is now underway for many cities across the U.S. Uh, we do have uh, videos and pictures coming in all across our news now from Fox Desk as uh, people have been uh, sharing their stories of uh, survival. Unfortunately, there have been, though, some lives that have been lost uh, because of these storms. And we uh, do have live reporter down in the uh, area where we are continuing to keep all of you up to date. So uh, let's head on out down to Alabama as we do have Fox's uh, Charles Watson, who is uh, joining us here live today. And so, uh, Charles, I know that uh, you have been uh, showing us some of that damage here today. Let's just kind of talk about what you're seeing here. This aftermath looks like it's been pretty destructive. Uh, yeah, it, you know, it has been pretty destructive. You know, those tornadoes were powerful enough to kill at least five people here in Alabama and two reportedly between Mississippi and Georgia. And uh, we are in one of the hardest hit uh, areas right now in Ohatchee, Alabama. And you can uh, see all the damage here behind me. You can see these large trees are down, twisted metal all over the place, homes that have been, you know, just flattened. And, uh, you know, you can see folks right now, they're really going through the process of trying to clean things up and get this community back together, uh, you know, as it looked just 24 hours ago. Now, there are a lot of people in this hard hit community, one, people who live here, who again are trying to gather their belongings, and two, you know, people who are just trying to offer help. And as you can see, you know, they have a lot on their hands right now after yesterday's tornado outbreak across the, the south. Uh, you know, and it goes to show you how powerful that tornado was when you see those large pieces of roof just wrapped around trees, sheds flipped over, cars that are totaled and power lines that are down at every turn. And just to get another idea of, uh, you know, how powerful that, that tornado was that hit here in Alabama yesterday, uh, just across the road there, there's a community. There were about 15 homes that were standing just 24 hours ago. Today, they're all gone, just reduced to rubble, you know, and it, you just got people's stuff just strewn all over the place as they're, you know, literally trying to pick up the pieces of their lives. Now, Charles, uh, we're taking a look at this damage. I know, obviously, there has to be kind of an extensive investigation done as before they categorize what kind of a tornado may have ripped through this area. But are uh, there are some reports as far as how strong those wind gusts were, because it, as you can see, that damage definitely has uh, destroyed a lot of this area. Yeah, so we, we haven't heard any official reports of how strong these tornadoes were, but you can imagine uh, that the storms will be categorized as very powerful uh, tornadoes. I don't want to make any guess of uh, what the strength was, but like I said, when you see a lot of the mobile homes out here that are just tossed all over the place, hanging from trees, these large trees that have been toppled over like they were chess pieces, you have to, uh, you know, sort of imagine that, you know, these storms were very powerful and they will be categorized as just that. But obviously, uh, all the people who are in charge of that, uh, county officials, uh, people from the National Weather Service are certainly out and about today and surveying this damage so they can sort of get an official estimate of, uh, you know, what everything will turn out to be. And lastly, I just wanted to ask about people's reactions to kind of maybe even some of the fears that they were having yesterday. Did you talk about some of their reaction as they heard these storms uh, moving across their homes, throwing all this stuff around? Oh, yeah, you know, well, this is Alabama, so I guess fortunately and maybe unfortunately, a lot of these folks have experiences with tornadoes in the past so a lot of people were able to prepare for them but you know we have spoken to people who have never experienced uh, severe weather like that tornadoes so it sort of caught them off guard luckily uh, you know they tell us that they were listening to local weather reports and local county officials and um, you know folks delivering the information that they need and they were able to heed those warnings and get to safe spaces uh, so they could preserve their lives but obviously um, there are a number of people 
who did not make it. We spoke to one gentleman earlier who lost three family members. Uh, one of his uh, his brother his brother in law just had eye surgery, so he wasn't able to really leave the house in time. And so, uh, you know, that gentleman and his wife and his daughter, they all were killed in the tornado, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, it's really um, intriguing and, 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 and inspiring to see um, the family members out here of people who were killed because they're handling this, you know, as best as you can imagine anyone would in circumstances like this. You know, these folks have had a rough 24 hours, but yet they're right across the road, right behind us, cleaning up uh, the mess of their own homes and, and trying to offer help to others as they go. And I know we had heard from some uh, authorities earlier this morning from some of those southern states saying they really do credit news stations and social media for helping warn people as much as they could. So thank you again, Charles Watson, for joining us live here on News Now from Fox. I know uh, cleanup still going to take a while. I know we'll have uh, another update coming uh, to our viewers here later this afternoon. And uh, on that note, let's head out to a quick two minute break as we continue to uh, follow more of these news stories happening across our states. We'll have more to come here again after two minutes. Thank you for being here with us on News Now from Fox. I did just see uh, we do have a press conference that's going to be coming up uh, in just about 20 more minutes. We're going to be going down to Georgia uh, at noon, and they had an update earlier that we brought to some of our uh, viewers who are watching on the stream about these deadly tornadoes that have been crossing through the area. They had said they had at least one person whose uh, life was lost in noon in Georgia, but uh, they do say that it was at least an EF2 tornado that had swept through their area. Now again, that was in Georgia. We just had that live update from Alabama. And we are expecting in the uh, one o'clock hour here in Arizona, uh, the four o'clock hour Eastern time, another live update from uh, our south storms that have been happening. And it's not done yet. We do still have precipitation and some storms uh, moving through the south, but they will be weaker than what we did see yesterday. So we're going to continue to keep everyone up to date as uh, we do get these reports coming into our news now from Fox desk. And as I mentioned, we are still waiting uh, also for our Texas border. Uh, media to uh, go and uh, do that live with our senators uh, from the Republican side who had been uh, touring the facilities, the uh, wall. They'd been doing a boat uh, tour as well. 
Hopefully we'll have that for you as soon. It looks like uh, they may be running behind on time, but as soon as that does become available, we'll of course be going into that live for you here on News Now from Fox. Uh, so until that time, COVID-19 uh, continues to take uh, a priority for many of our state leaders as they try to combat uh, the case numbers in their states, uh, but also they're trying to get vaccines to all of their residents. And so let's jump out. I do so we do have uh, our governor of Illinois, J.B. Pritzker. He is uh, doing a live uh, event right now. We're going to jump into it here for you on News Now. It's not, and we set that out when we when we laid out those criteria, and then it's on our website as well. If you can take a look. And are there more Johnson and Johnson doses coming? And how? And what, what's that? What, 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 so I'm a, I'm going to smile big because you know we're talking about some difficult subjects when we talk about uptick and upsurge of hospitalizations. But let me. Let me tell you how happy I am that the administration in Washington, D.C. is really doing a terrific job of pumping out every bit of vaccine that they can to the states. And as it turns out, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which has been a little bit on a hiatus, let's say, from the time that it was announced and we got our first set of doses, mainly because they're just manufacturing. Um, and we expect to see a significant number, millions of doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, coming, beginning very shortly in the next few days, and then hopefully a sustaining increase in Johnson & Johnson as well, as well as we are continuing to see an increase in Pfizer and Moderna. How did you handle the Johnson & Johnson yourself and you sore arm, anything like that? Do I look okay? Um, uh, my, my, uh, fine. My, you know, it's a little sore, obviously, whenever you get a vaccine uh, dose, and then, you know, the next day it gets a little better and the next day a little better. So, uh, but, but no side effects. And frankly, I'm so pleased and I'm counting down the days. Remember when you get vaccinated, it takes about two weeks for the vaccine to really take effect. Uh, and so I've got, I don't know, about 12 days left or so until the Johnson & Johnson really takes effect. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, please. Buckner. Yeah, chairman. So, as you may know, um, this is our, our deadline week for uh, bills to come out of committee. Um, so we're trying to get as much out of committee as we can. And this event is going to be uh, wrapping up. Uh, they've been uh, going at it for quite some time. And you just saw uh, J.B. Pritzker. He is the governor of Illinois stepping away from the podium as they've been taking some reporter questions here. Uh, so I want to continue to uh, bring you more uh, stories because we always like to keep you up to date, keep things moving along here for you guys. Uh, we do have uh, from our Fox team a uh, question and answers on COVID-19, everything from vaccinations to uh, the latest. It's happening here for you guys on News Now from Fox. A major milestone of one million residents fully vaccinated for COVID-19. In Illinois, as of Wednesday, more than five million people have been vaccinated and more states surrounding Illinois are opening up to larger groups. So what's going on in our state and how do we compare? We are joined by Dr. Shika Jane with the University of Illinois at Chicago. Happy Friday, Dr. Jane. Always a pleasure to see you. I want to start with that comparison right off the bat. How do you compare Illinois when it comes to the rollout with other states? Because at first glance, it seems like we could be doing a whole lot better. Yeah, so I think that compared to other states, if you look at states that are very dense or very densely populated, like California and New York, I'd say we're doing about the same. When you look at states like West Virginia that have had a really impressive rollout, they really focused on communities and getting um, you know, smaller pharmacies and community pharmacies to distribute the vaccine early on, while Illinois focused on larger organizations and, and hospitals. Now we're seeing an improvement in the distribution and the permeation into the communities with the new Chicago Protect Plus uh, initiative that's been launched. But I think that was one challenge early on that's now being uh, improved upon where we're getting it to the communities. And then Illinois has also really focused on an equitable dis, uh, distribution along with efficient, which has led to some confusion throughout the whole process, as we've heard recently with some news where some people weren't sure who could and couldn't get the vaccine. And 
and some questionable rollout. So I think this is all improving, but I say we're about average compared to states that are similar in size and population to ours. Okay, let's move on now to the positivity rate because it does seem to be on the increase. Illinois' positivity rate as of yesterday was at 2.7%. Now, just over, <clears throat> excuse me, just over a week ago, it was a record low of 2.1. And the numbers in Chicago also on the rise. According to the dashboard, the positivity rate 3.4 compared to 2.9 just a week ago. So what's driving it? Is it this UK variant that has shut down parts of Europe last month? How can we explain what we're seeing? And should we be concerned? I think there's multiple things that are driving it. So one, absolutely the variants probably have some role in driving this increase. But as we've talked about on multiple segments, once you roll back restrictions, once you start opening things up, we've seen numbers go up every single time. And now the next concern is we're in the middle of spring break. So obviously with that, we're concerned that we're gonna see even further increases in numbers. So it was to be expected to a certain extent, but this just goes to show again, we need to double down on all of our efforts to keep this under control so we don't end up out of control again. Yeah, I know we're all gonna be keeping an eye on that to make sure it doesn't keep increasing. Hopefully it will turn around, okay? Let's talk about the story that made headlines yesterday. 89 fully vaccinated Minnesotans have apparently tested positive for COVID-19. So is that cause for concern? And they're being referred to as breakthrough cases right now. Should we be concerned about this? I would not be concerned about it. We know any vaccine is not 100% effective. And the point should be made that it was 89 people out of, I believe, over 800,000. So that's less than a tenth of a percent of people who develop COVID-19 after being fully vaccinated. Remember, there is still a chance you could get COVID-19 after you get the vaccine and you're fully protected, but you shouldn't be hospitalized with very severe illness. Those 89 people did not get very sick and there have been no deaths from people who contracted COVID-19 after getting the vaccine. But if you get COVID-19, there is a chance that you could get very, very ill and potentially die. So that's why I'm not concerned about the 89 out of 800,000 people, because again, the vaccine is not 100% effective. We expect some people to still contract the virus. We don't expect them to get very sick or hopefully not require hospitalization after they're vaccinated. Dr. Shika Jane with the University of Illinois Chicago. Thank you. Great perspective as always. You have a wonderful weekend and we'll talk next week. Yeah. And thanks to our team there at Fox 32 Chicago. All right, guys, I do have a shot finally. It is on the ground, though. The camera's been set down, uh, but we are uh, anxious to get down to that Texas-Mexico border. And uh, hopefully we'll have our senators stepping out to speak to us very shortly. Let's head into a quick two-minute break. More on that when we come back.
And welcome back here to News Now from Fox. Here is our governor in Arizona, Doug Ducey, saying uh, that he has deployed the National Guard to the border to help support law enforcement. Now, he said uh, that he sat down this morning and had talked with uh, some senators about concerns and solutions, saying that the sheriffs need their help and uh, mayors need their help too down at the border. So it continues to be a crisis, not only uh, for the state of Texas, where we do have uh, some of our uh, senators from the Republican side touring the border, also tweeted out this uh, today is uh, this pictures and videos coming in. Uh, this is coming from a senator out of Oklahoma as he uh, says that this pod, uh, which usually uh, houses uh, nearly uh, 80 people, has been filled with 709 people. So he had uh, tweeted this out, and uh, and we're expecting to hear not only from uh, him, but also Senator Cruz, who is uh, leading uh, these Republicans on this uh, tour down at the border. He was kind of the one who took charge of uh, making it happen. And again, we are waiting for uh, their press conference as they get ready to uh, speak uh, to our camera crews. I did lose that shot, but hopefully it will be coming back. It looked like uh, they did have a lot of uh, Border Patrol agents uh, standing in a group off to the side. So as soon as we do get that back, we're of course going to be going uh, live down to that Texas-U.S.-Mexico border. All right, we're going to move things uh, back to that White House press conference, hopefully finish it out here for you guys, because uh, as you've been listening in uh, periodically, I've been bringing it back at, uh, to you once in a while here on the stream. Uh, border continues to be a top question that uh, Jen Psaki has been answering, along with uh, reopening schools that's along the COVID lines. And also she'd been asked about those deadly storms uh, that happened down in the south. So let's go back to that White House press conference. And as I mentioned, uh, if there is that shot uh, coming to our News Now from Fox desk down in Texas. We'll, of course, be jumping out to that here for you on News Now from Fox. The importance of kids going back to the classrooms. Mm -hmm. In many schools all across the country, they are not going back to the classrooms and there aren't imminent plans to do so because teachers unions say that they want their teachers to be vaccinated first, even though the CDC says that's not required. How are you going to deal with that? And are there any discussions about saying to teachers unions, you have to go back to the classrooms? Well, first, actually, 76% of schools are do have teaching, uh, do have kids in the classroom for part of the week, and about 46% uh, are back five days a week. And we expect that to continue to increase over time. Uh, the president said the majority. He wants the majority right, to but by day 100, and yes. we're on track right. to meet that objective. Uh, I will say that we took a step uh, in this administration to prioritize teachers uh, through our pharmacy program. We, that program is working. It's effective. Teachers can go. They are prioritized at pharmacies. It's something we had the power to take and implement even without even and we feel it's very much in line with the CDC guidelines because it is one of the mitigation steps and it's a step we had the power to take and put into place. We actually don't see an issue uh, coming up with um, with uh, schools not reopening. They are reopening, more are reopening every single week, and uh, we certainly feel we're on track to meet our goal. And when you look at some of the polling as it relates to the vaccinations, mm -hmm. still about 30% of adults say they don't plan to get one. How do you get things back to normal with those types of figures, and when specifically do you plan to move forward with the vaccine campaign to try to improve education? It's launching, Kristen. It's happening. Uh, we, we are launching a public campaign. There are some details that have been out um, and reported, um, uh, I believe, in the Wall Street Journal. We'll get all that information out to all of you. Uh, I will say that uh, what we have um, learned from our own data is that part of our investment and focus needs to be in trusted voices and trusted partners. We've seen some uh, improvement in confidence uh, among a range of communities in the efficacy of the, of the vaccine. That, that's good news, right? Uh, but we have seen concern about, and what we still have concern about, is uh, access. And that is the big issue, because now when we start to um, uh, get to uh, get to the point where we are trying to reach uh, more and more and more communities, of course, vaccinate adults, uh, Americans in this country, a lot of people can't take a day off to go get a vaccine. They don't have a fle the flexibility to be in the slot available. They maybe can't drive 
three miles to their local pharmacy. So our big investment right now is in access. That means increasing investments in mobile units, in community health centers, in mass vaccination sites. Uh, but it also means in terms of the public campaign, investing in trusted voices uh, and empowering local groups and organizations uh, to have the funding, the information and the assistance they need. Just to follow up with my question with the president yesterday, I asked him about transparency and access for journalists into some of the facilities at the border. The president said, I will commit when my plan is underway to have access. It sounded to a lot of people like he was saying, I will let more cameras in once I'm satisfied with the conditions. How is that consistent with trends? That's not actually what he meant. I'll first say we did allow access, including an NBC camera exclusively into the shelter facility on Wednesday. And we're committed to increasing access and doing additional pools, uh, making it available, these facilities, including the Border Patrol facilities, as well as the shelters. What he was conveying is right now his focus is on moving these kids. Uh, out of these border patrol facilities, right? And making sure it's done in a, a way that keeps them safe and keeps everyone safe. That does not imply that we are not going to allow access until that is done. It implies that is his first focus. So um, I, thanks for asking the question. That was his, in, in, that was his intention. And do you have a time frame for when, and noted that NBC did go in as pool. Do you have a time frame for when the next round of cameras might be allowed in? Oh, we're, we're working on it hopefully soon. Uh, and it's something we're certainly committed to and we're just working with DHS and HHS on when we can make it possible. Uh, oh, go ahead in the back. So obviously they're on guns. Obviously there's lots of pieces of legislation yeah. the president is advocating for. But when he spoke yesterday about priorities, some gun control groups felt frustrated. They felt like he was saying gun control is not a priority compared to infrastructure, compared to build back better. What's your response to, to groups who took that message away from the president's comments yesterday? Well, first, the president understands their frustration and he understands it as one of the few people in government who ever beat the NRA twice by leading the fight to pass the Brady Bill and the assault weapons ban. He understands as a person who led the effort at President Obama's request to strengthen gun measures after Sandy Hook and when that was voted down, helped put in place 23 executive actions to combat gun violence. You'll see more executive action as Josh and others were asking about and that review is underway and more efforts by him uh, and the administration to move forward in the weeks ahead, whether that is on legislation, supporting efforts that are happening in states, which we've seen is very effective and impactful and largely due to the advocacy and activism of a lot of these uh, groups. Uh, but, you know, we would say that um, the frustration should be vented at the members of the House and Senate who voted against the measures the president supports. And we'd certainly support their advocacy in that regard. Make sure, every, just a reminder for all of our viewers, uh, we do continue to stream all day on NewsNowFox.com. And don't forget, uh, very shortly, we're expecting to be down at that Texas-Mexico border as uh, we do have 18 senators on the Republican side touring facilities down in Texas. And the border crisis continues. We'll have more on that for you when we uh, have that shot for you just a little bit later here today. And he conveyed that over the last six months of the uh, uh, Trump administration, there was an increase of about 31 percent. We've seen an increase of about 29 percent over the last several months since he took office. So the point is, we've dealt with this before. Uh, it is often seasonal. Uh, it is often cyclical. And he just wanted to convey that in his effort to, to communicate and be, uh, provide educational information to the public. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that he is uh, addressing this by uh, putting forward uh, every resource at our disposal in the administration. Just in this past week, we've taken steps to bring a number of new facilities online from Fort Bliss, where there are 5,000 beds, to Lackland Air Force Base, where there are 350 beds, San Diego Convention Center, 1,400 beds. These three sites alone uh, provide at peak capacity an additional 6,750 6, beds. One of our biggest issues, as we've talked about before, is uh, moving these kids out of the Border Patrol facilities into the shelters. Uh, and we need to have places that are safe 
that have educational resources, health resources, mental health resources, legal resources, this is a step toward doing that. The other piece where he has been very focused, as we all have been, is on expediting processing at the border. And earlier this week, the Office of Refugee Resettlement also instituted a revised policy for certain children who have a parent or legal guardian in the United States. This will add more capacity and more swiftly unite kids with relatives and sponsors. So of course there should be a difference if it's a direct family member, a mother or father, um, and, and, and a different kind of adult, right? So there are steps to t we are taking to try to expedite even the processing. So our focus is on actions and solutions. We certainly know this is a challenge. It's something he has briefed on regularly um, and has is pushing his team to take more rapid action. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you, Jeff. The uh, president has said he wants bipartisan support, I think, for infrastructure package as well. Mm -hmm. Is that possible when Republicans are pretty adamant they don't want tax increases? In other words, how can we achieve bipartisan support for infrastructure if Republicans are, are drawing a line, a hard line on ta taxes? Well, first I would say, Peter, that I don't think most Republicans think that the United States, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, should be 13th in the world as it relates to infrastructure. You know, roads that are broken down, infrastructure that isn't working, a lack of access to broadband, that's not a democratic issue. And the president is going to continue to make that case. Now, we don't know what the votes will be. We haven't proposed a package yet. Uh, and certainly what it will be tied to and the pay-fors will be a part of that discussion. But he certainly believes there's been a history of support for investing in infrastructure. Uh, he has had bipartisan meetings in the White House. He's worked with Democrats and Republicans on getting legislation, uh, you know, getting steps taken in the past. Uh, and he's, he's hopeful that, uh, that, that there's an agreement on that moving forward. Go ahead, Anita. Thanks. Um Six former commissioners, FDA commissioners, have called on the president to go ahead and uh, nominate an FDA commissioner. Uh, you probably saw this week that the second in command there is, has announced that she's leaving. I'm wondering what, when the president plans to appoint someone or nominate someone mm -hmm. for the FDA. But more broadly, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about why the president is behind Presidents Obama and Trump on appointing both at the FDA and a variety of other uh, vacancies, including the Deputy Secretary at DHS and the Solicitor General. Well, I'll also point out that the president is also the first president to have all 15 cabinet nominees confirmed on this timeline and without a single one dropping out if we're just making comparisons between administrations. He certainly wants to have an FDA commissioner in place. He wants it to be the right person. And, uh, you know, there sometimes is a journey on personnel and determining who the right person is for the job, who's willing to do the job, who's available to do the job. And it's a priority, but I don't have a pre an update for you on, on when he will nominate someone. In general, just on some of these other positions, I take your point about the cabinet. I'm asking about some others, so. What was your question again? Well, just more broadly, why he's behind on some of these other positions that are not the actual cabinet that you've referred to. Well, I think it's a little bit of apples and oranges. Uh, we obviously have made a great deal of progress on, again, the people who are running and leading these agencies more than any administration since the Reagan administration. We feel very good about that. We've also walked into a white uh, presidency where he is dealing with a pandemic that is still killing 1,000 people a day, 10 million people out of work, racial injustice across the country, a climate crisis. So he's got a few things on his plate, but he is committed to personnel, moving things forward, and certainly wants to have a full team across agencies. And then if I could just follow up on something, you mentioned Title 42, which closes the border to non-essential travel. Um, several, before President Biden was president, mm -hmm. several lawmakers, including then Senator Harris, now Vice President, obviously, called it unconsti an unconstitutional executive power grab that had no known precedent or le le clear legal rationale. Why is that still something that is that he has not rescinded? What is his, is he reviewing that? What is the situation there? He clearly doesn't agree with the vice president on that. It's in place for public health reasons, given we're in the midst of a pandemic. Um, that's why it's in place. I think we're gonna have to move on. Go ahead. Uh, a couple of COVID questions, Jen. Um, since January, the number of Americans who have been tested for COVID has dropped off dramatically as more people are getting uh, mm -hmm. vaccinated. This is a real concern for public health officials who think that testing is you know, a cornerstone to keeping the pandemic in check. So what is the administration's plan is to make sure that those testing numbers don't fall off further as more people get vaccinated? You're absolutely right. And testing is a key part of returning to normalcy, whether it's schools or workplaces or businesses, especially as we still have 
um, a majority of the population that still needs to be vaccinated, although we're working to expedite that. There is funding in the American Rescue Plan. Um, there is funding uh, to also uh, allow for that or institute or give funding, I should say, uh, to schools to also uh, make that available there. So it's something that we'll continue to communicate about to governors, to uh, school leaders, to businesses about the importance of testing. And we have resources now that have been passed in the American Rescue Plan to help uh, alleviate some of the cost. And one more, the, the NFL has announced that it does not want to require players, coaches, staff members to get the, the COVID vaccine if they want to play, practice, etc. Is that a mistake and should this vaccine be required for athletes? Well, I would certainly, I don't know that we're making NFL policy from here, but it is certainly recommended by public health officials, uh, by uh, officials from our federal government, because it's how we can keep people safe and healthy, uh, whether it's our family members or our uh, friends or people in the stands who are attending these games. So certainly we would advise any entity uh, to follow public health guidelines, to uh, recommend that uh, their players, the members of the NFL, follow those public health guidelines, whether it's mask wearing, social distancing, uh, washing hands, and certainly getting the vaccine when they have access. Go ahead. Uh, so a question again about voting rights. Uh, the president has expressed support for HR1. Yeah. He's going to put out a statement later today. What else does he have planned as far as travel or working with senators to push legislation forward? What other specifics can you share about his use of the bullet pulpit to push that forward? That one more question on behalf of uh, Okay, the no problem. Um, first, as the president conveyed yesterday, um, he feels that um, voting rights um, are uh, pushing back on voting rights, making it harder. Okay, everybody, as you can see, we are moments away from uh, GOP senators giving an update on the border crisis, what they are seeing firsthand. We'll bring that to you coming up in just moments, everybody here on News Now from Fox. In the meantime, everybody, we do want to go out to a live update on uh, the Alabama horrible, horrible storm that passed through there yesterday and into the evening. Here's the latest. Uh, security heightened uh, in the affected areas. We encourage uh, our citizens of uh, Coweta or Noonan to call 911 throughout the night if you believe anybody is uh, on a piece of property that they should not be. Uh, we will respond, identify those individuals and attempt uh, to prevent any thefts uh, of personal belongings uh, in those affected areas. One thing I would like to add is that uh, we believe uh, most of our roadways except for East Broad Street are now open uh, to passable traffic, at least one lane uh, being uh, East Broad Street and, I'm sorry, Smoky Road, LaGrange Street right at the city limits. Those still have high transmission power lines down that Georgia Power is working on. Uh, so we ask the citizens to stay away from those two streets. Most of the other streets have opened up or will be opening soon, we, we believe. so. Unless you have questions, I'll let uh, Chief uh, from the Coweta County Fire Department uh, brief you on their operation. Good afternoon, Pat Wilson, Coweta County Fire Rescue Department, Fire Chief for, uh, for uh, the county. Uh, again, you know, as everyone has said, you know, uh, you know, as we begin to uh, kind of change our mode of operation to more recovery, uh, just extremely proud of just all the work that's done today, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's catastrophic damage. Uh, uh, having the opportunity to go out uh, earlier today and uh, just see uh, just the, the devastation uh, that is taking place in our community is it's difficult as a, as, as a fire chief. And I know uh, Chief Brown and I, you know, uh, just it was, uh, it was very hard, right? But the one thing that was uplifting is to see the community coming together, everyone uh, 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 helping others. Uh, so incredible today, and uh, I, I just have to say, you know, from my uh, perspective, uh, the teamwork uh, with our, our team from 911, uh, having to overcome challenges this morning, uh, having a tornado bearing down on top of them, uh, to be able to get calls dispatched. Uh, having units responding uh, as quickly as uh, we were able to do uh, this morning was so incredible. Uh, the teamwork uh, this, of this amazing group behind me right now uh, was incredible. Uh, you know, uh, everybody worked so well. I think uh, 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 just 
incredible work. Uh, so basically, you know, we are, like I said, in recovery. Uh, you know, uh, homes have been searched. Uh, very, uh, just so, so uh, happy that uh, uh, injuries were minimal because it could have been a lot worse. And for sure, knowing that uh, uh, only having uh, one uh, 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 fatality uh, throughout this whole incident uh, definitely uh, is, is just a miracle uh, for our community. Thank you so much. Has that one fatality been identified yet? Has not been. Uh, that at this time, so we, you know, because of uh, some of the issues that we had uh, this morning, so we're still working. Uh, that's going to be a lot of hand count on uh, going back through and just getting all that together. So it's probably going to take us a couple of days, I would imagine, uh, just with, uh, you know, getting our crews together to be able to go through all that paperwork to be able to get the actual numbers. And your 911 system is still having uh, fiber? Turn it back over. Thank you. Yeah, currently, currently, we're still... Uh, down uh, don't have our CAD operations so we do not have the fiber going we are just on radio and telephone uh, so we're working through that and we have some solutions in, pl uh, in place that we think we can overcome that in the next two hours we're hoping that's going to be the case uh, we're working with our IT department and our uh, GEMA Homeland Security group to try and get that uh, problem solved now so we think we have something in place hopefully by the end of the day we'll have that working Yes, ma'am, we have, uh, uh, my knowledge, we had three families, about approximately 15 people that are being sheltered at the local middle school uh, where they've been fed and uh, temporarily housed until we can get them into a, a hotel is what the Red Cross was trying to do. So. Can you talk earlier about donations? That uh, we're getting a lot of donations. I'm not sure if the, yeah. Uh, we're actually, almost overwhelmed with our community giving uh, donations as freely as they are uh, that we're filling Connex containers full of water we've got pallets full of water uh, dry goods canned foods our community has been fabulous um, we've had people as far as Henry County drive over and bring us uh, things at the donation center uh, I would like to reiterate uh, and we've changed a little bit or updated a little bit on our donation center uh, currently, uh, we will be accepting donations until 5 p.m. this evening. Again, the address for that is 1515 Lower Fayetteville Road, Noonan, Georgia, 30265. That is our Noonan Center, which is our uh, city conference center out on Lower Fayetteville Road. Uh, we have staff out there accepting those. Tomorrow uh, at that same location, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., uh, we'll be accepting those as well. We are asking all donations all donations to please go to that location now uh, the police department is full uh, we cannot accept anything else at our police department right now uh, i believe we've uh, filtered some of that out to fire departments and the sheriff's office uh, if not they'll be getting their shipment here very soon and uh, we're just trying to take care of our people in the community with those donations sunday we believe that that location will still be the same on lower Fetville road but we'll confirm that for you tomorrow as well so we'll get that information out so Are there other agencies like red, cross red cross has been notified i have not personally been on site with them or they in, they are so they would be at the shelter uh, assisting getting those individuals uh placed uh properly into a hotel or temporary housing president biden coming out right now let's listen uh, I haven't yet, but they know they're invited, but I haven't invited, I haven't spoken to either one of them yet, individually. I just got off the phone speaking with the British Prime Minister, and yesterday I spoke with all the members of the EU, so, uh, but I, I haven't spoken to those two. Could you have comment on the new Georgia election law, Mr. President? Say again? The new Georgia election law? It's an atrocity. The idea, if you want any indication it has nothing to do with fairness, nothing to do with decency. They passed a law saying you can't provide water for people standing in line while they're waiting to vote. You don't need anything else to know that this is nothing but punitive designed to keep people from voting. You can't provide water for people about to vote. Give me a break. Give me a break. President Biden making some remarks. Uh, 
After leaving the White House on his way right now to Delaware, this was just moments ago with the tape playback, and there's the little jog right to Marine One as he is now heading to Delaware for the weekend. Let's take you out live right now. These are live images. Marine One at Joint Base Andrews right now awaiting President Biden to come down those steps and up the steps of Air Force One. Thank you so much for joining us here on News Now from Fox today. It's going to be a busy Friday, so uh, we have a lot in store for you. Coming up in the next 30 minutes or so, we are expecting uh, the senators, Republican senators, about 18 of them, went to the border. They're at the border right now. They're going to give us the latest on what they're seeing and how they feel about the crisis situation happening right now. So we'll be bringing that to you live when that does happen in just moments here. President Biden going up the steps there, and we're going to take a quick two-minute break here on News Now from Fox. When we come back, we will uh, keep you with the Biden administration. Go out to Vice President Kamala Harris as she's holding a listening session at the Boys and Girls Club of New Haven, talking about uh, child poverty and education matters. We'll bring that to you on the flip side of this two-minute break. And all of these other systems are so direct. And we um, also, about the, the investment that we're putting in our public schools, K through 12, understanding that our, our educators, everyone in the educational ecosystem, um, including parents and students, deserve to have that infusion of resources to address the harm and the damage from the pandemic, but again, also a history, a recent history of inadequately funding our public schools. And so this is some of the work that we are excited about. And um, here in Connecticut, you also have a leader in Rosa DeLauro, who I will see later, who um, I will say in this venue also has been um, a champion for years and years and years on many issues, including the child tax credit. And for the reason um, that because of the work she has done and all of you have done, I'm very excited to be here in Connecticut. Uh, you know, when I think about the importance of a place like this, I think of it in the context of how I grew up. So I grew up one of two daughters of a mother who had um, a, an incredible passion to do the work that she did as a cancer researcher. My mother had two goals in her life, to raise her two daughters and end breast cancer. And often, she would work very late nights and sometimes on weekends. And when she did, we would walk two houses down to Mrs. Regina Shelton, who was a second mother to us. And in fact, Ms. Shelton ran the, and, and it was her daycare center, and we lived on top of it in the apartment upstairs. And she was a second mother to us. She took care of us, she nurtured us, she loved us. That was a great blessing so that my mother could do the work that eventually she did that was to find certain discoveries on the issue of breast cancer. She could not have done that work without Ms. Shelton. And that is a truth for all working parents. They need that kind of support to go on then and pursue their passion, whatever it may be, not to mention be able to provide for their family and its essential needs. So that's the lens through which I think about what we are doing. And then in the context of what we must do to not only support our parents, but support um, the infrastructure around them. So as we each present, I would ask that in particular here in Connecticut and for the educators, but everyone, let's talk a little bit about what you have seen over the course of the last year in terms of the resources that have been available and those that have not been available and what you see as being some of the lingering effects that we need to address in Washington. Um, I'm also interested uh, in knowing how you are measuring and how you are anticipating what we must address in terms of the mental health impact of this last year, not to mention the mental health impact of poverty. Because let us be clear, poverty is trauma-inducing. And so how we are thinking about the entire ecosystem around issues like alleviating poverty and addressing um, the effects of poverty on our children. And with that, I'm going to... Return the mic Thank to you. the secretary and let's begin our discussion. Oh, that's inspiring. So we're going to have a great conversation. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to transition kind of to a, just a quick, uh, we're going to give about a minute for each person. Okay, looks like that is all we are getting from this listening session. Just hearing from the vice president there. 
So, we thought we were going to hear from some uh, other people in that roundtable. Not the case there. So, what we'll do is take another quick two-minute break for you right here on News Now from Fox. We are live and worldwide here for you. Air Force One about to head over to Delaware for President Biden. We're going to be spending the weekend back home. For those of you sticking around here with us, we should just point out that about 10, 15 minutes away from hearing from a Republican senators at the border, and they'll be doing a news conference, we'll be bringing that to you in just moments. In the meantime, let's hear from Governor Ron DeSantis, had a roundtable of it himself today. And so... We're here today to, to talk about a way forward for the cruise industry. We think it's very, very important. Obviously, we have a number of seaports throughout the state. Uh, it's, it's more of an integral role in some ports than in others. So, for example, here, this is a, a critical, huge part of, of, of what this port is doing. Uh, it's important in other ones, but you have some that have a lot of cargo and everything that's still been able to, to go throughout COVID. Uh, but we need to be able to get these cruise lines operating again. And if you look at what's going on around the country, but particularly in Florida, you know, we've, we vaccinated, we're going to be at 3.5 million seniors soon that have gotten shots. It's going to be like 75, 70, I, you know, I don't even know with the demand how much higher you're going to be able to get at that point, but certainly it's going to be available. We're going to go 40 and above starting on Monday, anybody eligible 40 and above. And then the next week, any adult will be eligible to get any of these vaccines. And so if you look at kind of what we've been doing, I mean, just with initial dose, out 110 uh, uh, Tuesday. First dose of. If you noticed in all the different CARES Act and everything that was done, they didn't provide anything for any of the seaports. And so obviously we had a lot that were really affected. So when we got the, the most recent stimulus with the state money, uh, part of what I've recommended the legislature do with that is uh, use about $260 million to provide support for Florida seaports. And we basically just totaled up the losses through February and, and arrived at that. I, unfortunately, I mean, there, there's probably going to be more, especially if we can't get the, the ships going. Um, and so this money will, um, will help support, um, but it is not going to be enough if we can't get the ships uh, to sail. So that's what we want to do. And if you look here at Port Canaveral, the second leading uh, cruise port behind uh, Port Miami, is reported an estimated loss of 86.7 million over the course of the pandemic. And again, there's really not much they could have done about it given w what's going on. So we're in a situation where you have this conditional sale order. There hasn't been a single cruise line that's completed even phase one of the four phase plan. Uh, the CDC hasn't updated any of its findings with current data to justify the lockdown of this industry. Um, and, you know, this cruise industry, they've, from the very beginning, when this came, there was an outbreak on this Diamond Princess. That was kind of one of the main things. And so the cruise uh, industry was focused on, and they were trying to figure out, okay, well, what do, you, what, should, what do we need to do? What do you do this? And then they did the no sale. So then they're like, okay we got to figure out a way back. And so they've been working on this for, for months and months and months to try to prepare for this. Um, but they've just been blocked by the CDC every step of the way. So people are right now cruising in other countries. You know, you have this as being done in the Mediterranean and other places. And I know some of the, the folks from the industry can talk about that. And of course, we have all kinds of stuff going on, and not just in Florida, where we're probably the most robust state in the country in terms of uh, options for people. But you know, we have people flying on airplanes, they're, they're, they're on buses, hotels, restaurants, theme parks, casinos, bar, you name it. All this stuff is, is gone, but somehow the, the cruise is, is viewed as, as differently. So we, we want a way forward, and we're all united here to say we need a way forward. So I want to hear from some of these folks, uh, have a discussion, and then hopefully get the, the, uh, a decision, give them a date where they can go so they can plan 
and be ready to go. And I can tell you, we'll put a lot of people back to work in this state uh, if we're able to do it. So I would like to turn it over to the Attorney General. Thank you, Governor. And many of you know I've been, I'm a fifth generation Floridian. I have never been more proud to be a Floridian as I am right now, uh, especially under the leadership of this governor who is these folks are Floridians just trying to provide for their families. This governor has been focused on how do we balance the health and safety of our communities with Floridians' right to make a living and provide for their families. So proud of this administration and really Accelerating close to 50 transportation projects throughout the state, valued at several billions of dollars, ultimately benefiting every single person in every part of the state. And as the governor mentioned just last week, you know, he outlined his recommendations for the best use of those funds from the American Relief Plan. And beyond the 260 million that he mentioned going to the ports, he also proposed another 930 million for the Department of Transportation in our work program. Again, noticing and recognizing the important factor that the transportation network has for moving people and goods throughout the state. But as you heard, just because, you know, because of the CDC's no sale order, the members of our communities who are in this industry, who are directly impacted by the inability for the cruise ships to sail, they're still struggling. And it'll take many, many months for that industry and those communities to recover. You don't have to go far to see the lasting impact. Just look around the port where we are today. Beautiful facility, but it's empty, entirely empty. Other than us here today. Florida is well known as the cruise capital of the world, spending, sending more than not close to nine million passengers. And the top three cruise ports in the world are right here in Florida, with Canaveral being one of them. So just recently, I just wanted to share with you a little bit of statistics, as you mentioned, General, about some of the numbers. In you know, a September 2020 report from the Federal Maritime Commission estimated that during the first six months of the pandemic, losses in Florida due to the cruise industry shut down total over $3 billion in economic activity, including 49,500 jobs paying over $2 billion in wages. Think about that. More than 49,000 of your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues out of work. And that was just the first six months, and here we are a year later. So from the travel agents to those that support the ships when they come into port, to those at area hotels and restaurants, each of them are impacted by the sole decision of the CDC. Families are suffering. And in addition to these vital people, their economic impact is staggering. So think about the activities that occur on a cruise ship, for example. Dining. Right? Restaurants on land have been open with no issues. Entertainment. Theaters are now reopening and have put in proper, appropriate safeguards to protect their customers. Hotels. Hotels have been open for quite a long time now. Again, providing the necessary sanitation and controls in place on behalf of their customers and their visitors. So what's the difference when we have these opportunities on land but we want to put them on sea. So the governor of the state will continue to do all that he can to help those members of our communities again regain their livelihood and hope our federal counterparts will follow suit. Thank you again, Governor, for having me here today. Thank you for your leadership and for fighting for Floridians in this essential industry. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, Captain John Murray, uh, CEO of Port Canaveral. Governor, thank you uh, for, for coming to Port Canaveral with the Attorney General and, and the Secretary today. We can't thank you enough for taking on this, uh, this leadership role uh, with the CDC. Uh, this has been a long year. It's been a very particularly tough year for Port Canaveral and for our, our port tenants and everybody that's related to the cruise industry here at the port. Uh, cruise represents about 80% of our book of business and 80% uh, of our revenue stream. And, and uh, for the last year, it's been particularly hard at Port Canaveral. We had to uh, go through a reduction in force of our own team of 43%. Uh, 
Uh, it, it was a, a, a very difficult time for us. Uh, we have people that are totally dedicated to the cruise industry that are, that are still unemployed and they're just waiting to come back to work. Most of the folks that did work here are ready to come back. They, they want to work at the port. Um, this terminal is, is really a unique uh, example of, of what's happened in the past year. We, we financed this terminal ourselves uh, with bonding, bank money, and cash from operations. $155 million facility. We've been paying the debt on it since we financed it over a year ago. Uh, we haven't had one revenue dollar through here yet. It's a uh, state-of-the-art facility, as you can see, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really tough to have an asset like this on the books and be paying the bills and, and not have any of the, uh, the revenue. So uh, we really need to get back to work. It's time. I've been saying this repeatedly in our commission meetings, and uh, we've got one agency that has us shut down, and, and we really appreciate your leadership in, in taking this on. Thank you. Sure. Okay, you know, back, you go back to last March, the concern and the rationale for doing things like no sale was that, you know, our, our health system would be overwhelmed by corona patients, and that was the, the, the overwhelming of hospitals. Um, and, and look, that was based on, you know, some legitimate concerns. It was also based on some very faulty academic models that were just so wrong. But nevertheless, uh, you could argue be safe and sorry. Well, now we're at the point where, obviously, you're not going to have these hospitals overwhelmed. I mean, it hasn't happened anywhere in the, in the country in terms of not being able to treat patients. I mean, some got very busy in certain parts of the country. We had some in our state that got, that got pretty busy over the summer in particular. But it seems like the rationale for these continued lockdowns of cruise industry and then some of the things other states are doing is, is not to prevent hospital overrun, but to just have no case, like zero cases. That's not possible to achieve and you end up destroying people's lives trying to achieve it. And so that's never been a valid basis to restrict people. And so we need to say, we under, we're gonna be fine. I can tell you in Florida last year, I didn't know if, if the cruise lines are gonna have a bunch of sick patients, how that would affect my hospitals. Of course, we were, we're, I have no con Okay, that was just some of Governor Ron DeSantis there in Florida. I want to give you a little bit more of uh, the feeds that we are getting from the border right now. Pretty soon, everyone, we are just in this holding pattern uh, for the senators, 18 senators that went to the border today, and uh, we will be getting their statements in just a little bit. As soon as that happens, we'll bring it to you right here on News Now from Fox. But I do want to go up to some other breaking news here that we had for you a little bit earlier. Just wanted to give you an update here on the very sad situation in Egypt right now. Let me get this here for you, updated. What is going At least 32 people are dead, more than 115 injured after two trains crashed today in southern Egypt. Officials say this is the latest in a series of deadly crashes on the country's railways. The crash happened when someone apparently activated the emergency brakes on the passenger train, causing it to be rear-ended by another train. Video shows the two trains derailed and flipped on their side. However, the prime minister in Egypt later said no official cause has been determined at this time. More than 100 ambulances were sent to the scene in the province about 270 miles south of Cario. Health, health minister said and the injured were taken to four hospitals. Injuries included bro broken bones, cuts, and bruises. Two planes carrying a total of 52 doctors, mostly surgeons, were sent to the area, and a military plane thought those needing special surgery to the capital as well. So we will follow this here for you. Looks like we just did get this podium shot there back into the states here on the border. It says stop the border crisis. We're going to be hearing from the senators in just a little bit here on News Now from Fox. Soon as that happens, we'll pop that up. We do have another live event. As far as I think many. We do have uh, the former president, Bill Clinton, with the current vice president, Kamala Harris, doing a discussion right now. We'll take a little listen to this and be in the holding pattern right now for the 18 senators being able to pay their rent or put food on the table to perform those duties so those are some of the things that we are addressing 
but it has definitely highlighted this pandemic, also the challenges specifically for women in the workforce, uh, and as evidenced by the fact that over 2 million women in the United States have left the workforce during this pandemic because of those competing responsibilities, and in particular, um, their responsibilities to care for children, and in many cases, children and parents at the same time. A lot of those women were single parents. And that's right. To your point, and I know you, during the course of your presidency, but your life works, has, you have always focused on the issue of poverty and what we must do to lift folks out of poverty. Uh, one of the, the components of the American Rescue Plan that, that I'm most excited about is exactly what you mentioned. Through the child tax credit, we believe that half of America's children who live in poverty will be lifted out of poverty. And that is not only about this moment, but the intergenerational impact of that approach. Um, it's very exciting in terms of, I think, also the duty that society should have and a government should have to the least of these, and in particular, our children and our children who are living in poverty. One other thing I think is going to happen is because you have focused on helping people from the bottom up and mm -hmm. the middle out, I predict that everybody's going to be better off yeah. and we'll, we'll finally, maybe we can win this argument when everybody wins, <laughs> maybe we can get these things institutionalized more, but yeah. it, I, I don't, I don't, Today, I don't think most Americans understand the the breadth and depth of the things that are in this bill and what it, it will do to lift people. And uh, you know, when Al Gore was vice president, he, he did a fabulous job. But he had a wonderful saying. He said, "Whenever I vote, we win." <laughs> I have adopted that saying. I'll tell you, the first time I said it, I said, like Al Gore said. Then the next time I said, I said, well, like someone famous said. And then now I just say, like I always say, when I vote, I win. <laughs> and because of the division, you may have, a, you may cast more tie vacant votes than any vice president in history. I know it is, you know, I mean, it is my hope. It is my hope that we can find common ground and consensus and bipartisan consensus. That would be the best outcome. Um, but where we cannot, and we, when we're talking about things like lifting children out of poverty, then we're going to have to, we're just going to have to get it done. And, um, and so to your point, that, that often might present itself with, with me breaking the tie as the president of the Senate in addition to being vice president. Well, I thank you for doing it. Thank you. Uh, let, let's talk about another issue that I think is important to young women and to people of color, and that is diversifying the participation of all Americans and all walks of life and work. Yes. Uh, your mother was a scientist. Yes, she was. And uh, I wonder how much that affected your decisions about the importance of education, what you want to do with your life, mm -hmm. and now what you want to say to all these young women of color and all young people that are never that have never been to college before about what they should be doing and what we should be doing to help them. So my mother um, had a profound influence on my life. All five feet, one inch of her. <laughs> if you'd ever met her, you would have thought she was 10 feet tall. And she was um, one of the few and probably one of the first women of color um, to be in science at the time that she entered that profession. My mother had two goals in her life, to raise her two daughters and end breast cancer. And um, she was passionate about her work. She was passionate about women's health issues. She was passionate about addressing and speaking truth about racial disparities and, and racial bias in the healthcare system. And in every way that informed um, my perspective on a number of things, including the importance of what, what scientists and engineers and people like that do, which is they are, they are motivated by a, a vision of what can be unburdened by what has been. 
You know, their, theirs is the noble pursuit, I dare say, of, of innovation, right? And, and the pursuit of innovation for the sake of improving the condition of, of humankind, of, 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 of alleviating suffering, right? It, innovation is, you know, let's be clear, it, it's not that we create something new because we're bored with things the way they've been. Innovation in its best form is about saying, let's, let's be better, let's make things more accurate, faster, more, more relevant to, 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 to a greater number of people. And that was her passion. And we can now look at this pandemic and see that these professions in the healthcare sector, um, the scientists, the engineers, the technologists, are are the professions among others that are really improving human condition and human life and so we want to encourage all people to have an opportunity to pursue that path and to pursue that passion and that's why i share um a, a, a goal of yours which is to make sure that we create that path that we have a, a commitment to STEM jobs and STEM education for all our kids, regardless of their race, regardless of their gender. And um, I think we're going to be better off as a country for it, but there's still so much to be done. Um, in the course of the pandemic, I visited the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and I met an incredible scientist by the name of Dr. Kizzy Corbett, who is an African-American woman who helped create the vaccine, which I took. <laughs> and when I think our students and our young leaders can see these folks who have been doing this work, it will renew their confidence in their rightful place to be among those great professionals, if that's their choice. I, I spent some time, um, having a conversation it was one of my most enjoyable things, Mr. President, since I've been vice president. I talked with astronauts who were currently on the space station. It was just fantastic. Okay. And there were two women, um, Dr. Shannon Walker and Dr. Kate Rubin. And they did exactly what you would hope they would do. I was on this monitor and there was a time delay because of course they're in space, right? And so I'm sitting there and they dropped down into the screen because of course they were right? There's no gravity. It, it was just, they were like superheroes in the way they just appeared. And they were so passionate about the scientific research they're doing in space, these two women. So we want to make sure we not only create a pathway, but that we, we keep uplifting these incredible models of who can do what. Well, <clears throat> I think space is a good metaphor, and I also think it's an important frontier still. Yes. Uh, the one of the best things to ever come out of this CGI experiment, you know, everybody who's watching you, all the young people are supposed to be part of making commitments to do what they can on their yes. own. Yes. And after the financial crash in 2008, we held for several years a CGI. Just we will be taking a quick two-minute break here on News Now from Fox. We wound up with 24 mm. because President Obama had said that we needed 100,000 more STEM teachers, and it was up, and the Congress wouldn't give it to them. So we raised the money mm. through our, our 24 partners did, and they met the goal ahead of time. And I'm hoping now, when you get into your infrastructure program and other things, that you'll be able to get some. Republican support, but I think yeah. I had an interesting deal with Newt Gingrich, who was interested in science. I said, you can't be interested in science if you don't fund it. Uh -huh. So we made a deal to bust the caps on the committee that had education funding and science funding, and I'd do the, I'd break the cap on education and he'd break it on science. So That's I'd a good deal. <laughs> yeah, it was a good deal because if the Republicans were able to say, well, look what we're doing, we're increasing the uh, appropriations for the NIH. Right. It, it worked great, and I'm really hoping it works out for you because yeah. uh, when Harold Varmus ran the NIH for me, he did a very interesting thing. He took all the members of Congress, the new members, Republicans and Democrats, uh -huh. and he put them in a bed at NIH and lifted the back of the bed and watched them look at the hospital room television in which he played a video of all the things they were doing there 
that could lengthen their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Right. It had an amazing impact on them. And it made them see that there are things that no matter how conservative you think you are, that will not happen unless governments make investments to begin what will then be a journey that hopefully will, you know, we spent $3 billion on the human genome project. And that was uh, a little over 20 years ago when we announced the full sec sequencing. It's now produced uh, almost $300 billion in private sector investment. This is a good investment for America. This, and there's so much uh, that I think will prove to be profitable in what you're doing now. And I'm so grateful to you. Well, I, and I just want to thank you because as president, you really did highlight that and the importance of also the public funding of this research. So that when we look at the, the advances that can be made, the discoveries that are made, they are a function of what is in the best interest of the public and the public good. And not only, um, you know, what, what might be in the best interest of profit. And certainly when we talk about the essential functions of government, what should be the, thought of as the essential functions, public health is one of the three, I'd argue, public education, public safety, and public health. And, um, and so the, the public funding through NIH, through public universities, and the research they do is critical, I think, to making sure that the health issues of all people are addressed, not just those who have resources. On balance, what makes you optimistic about the future? Oh, a, a lot. You know, I, um, I'm clear-eyed. I see what's wrong. I do strongly believe one must speak truth. And sometimes truth can be difficult to speak and certainly difficult to hear. But if we're going to address what needs to be handled, we have to speak truth. But, but, but be optimistic that, that we have seen in our lifetimes um, the, that the courage of the angels walking among us, and right now in the midst of the pandemic, that's the, the frontline workers. Um, the innovation of the people who are scientists like Kizzy Corbett. Uh, we, can, we can do better, we can be better, we can, we can solve problems, we can improve human condition. So I remain optimistic because I've seen so much good work around me. And, um, and, I, and I'm optimistic because of all the young leaders that you got in CGI University. <laughs> I mean, these hundreds of commitments these young leaders have made, and I've been reading about what they are doing in their communities, what they are doing to, to 